All right. Uh, I'll go ahead and call the meeting of the ISFMP Policy Board to order. Uh, for those of you that are uh, virtual, this is Spud Woodward, Governor's Appointee Commissioner from the state of Georgia and uh, current Commission Chair. And uh, welcome everybody to our meeting. Uh, our first order of business is approval of the agenda. Uh, are there any uh, requested modifications or changes to the agenda? If so, raise your hand, be recognized. Don't see anything, uh, any opposition to accepting the agenda is presented. Don't see any, so we'll consider the agenda adopted by unanimous consent. Uh, in your briefing materials, we also had proceedings from our May 2022 policy board meeting. Any edits, modifications, uh, corrections to the minutes? Don't see any. Um, any opposition to accepting those minutes and proceedings? Seeing none, we'll consider those accepted by unanimous consent as well. This is a time we have available for public comment. We have any, I don't see anybody in the audience. We have anybody online? I don't see any hands, so no public comment. So at this point, I'll, I'll give a brief report on our executive committee meeting, which was held yesterday from 8 to 10. Um, after our administrative duties with the agenda and the meeting summary, uh, we had no public comment. Uh, Bob gave a brief CARES Act update. Uh, things are proceeding well. Um, we are looking at probably a significant underspend of CARES II, and so the executive committee will be deliberating on that uh, in the future as far as possibly shifting money from uh, unspent jurisdictions to those that still have remaining needs we did that with cares one it worked out real good so uh so that's proceeding along the the next thing we did was uh, received a report from the de minimis work group um from tony kearns uh i want to thank that group for the work they've done well we discussed that report uh quite a while and actually came up with some uh, recommended preferreds under the options where there are option categories and Tony will be reporting on that a little later on in our agenda. We also uh, reviewed an updated investment policy. Um, the way the commission operates uh, is it tries to maintain an adequate balance in an operating fund to cover uh, costs associated with staffing and operations um, and in the past, we've had sort of a three-tier approach. Uh, going forward, we're gonna have a two-tier approach. We'll have an operating fund balance and we'll have a reserve fund. And that reserve fund will be there as a, <clears throat> as a contingency. Those monies are invested in a portfolio, diverse portfolio that, that mixes you know, gain with, with low risk. And so uh, going forward, whenever um, we develop an annual budget, um, we'll be looking at the budget and unspent funds and how to possibly either move those funds into activities or to per, uh, perhaps add them back to the reserve fund. So that was approved by the executive committee. Uh, next thing we did was reviewed a letter of support uh, for Resilient Coast and Estuaries Act. Um, that was brought to us by the legislative committee and uh, we approved that. And later on in our agenda, I'm gonna ask uh, Bill Hyatt, our legislative committee chair to to bring that forward to the policy board for uh, consideration. Uh, next, we uh, had a presentation from Dr. Lindy Heist Dutton. Uh, she is executive director of the Responsible Offshore Science Alliance. That group has come to the states from Maine to North Carolina asking for some support. Uh, she gave a um, overview of that entity's activities, uh, the kind of things they're doing, uh, how important and relevant they're going to be. So that was a, an informational presentation to the executive committee. Uh, then we also had a review of the latest version of the appeals policy, which uh, we're calling now the zombie policy, because every time we try to get it done, it keeps rising back up again and, and takes on new life. And uh, hopefully today we can actually finally put it to rest. Uh, that's another thing that we'll be dealing with a little later in the agenda but the executive committee approved uh, the latest version of it. Uh, other under, other business, um, 
our uh, awards committee chair, um, Jim Gilmore, brought up the idea that uh, arose during the most recent committee deliberations of recognizing those folks in the states that have done a superlative job managing the CARES Act on top of their other duties. And so that's something the awards committee will be working towards. And then lastly, we received a uh, annual meeting update. Uh, like all of you should have seen your emails from Tina, but that will be November 6 through 10, 2022 at the Ocean Place Resort in Long Branch, New Jersey. And uh, Tom Fody uh, mentioned that there will be fishing opportunities. So uh, if you do have plans on coming in early or have the opportunity to come in early, there'll be some opportunities. So please just make, you know, factor that in your long term planning and get back in touch with with uh with joe and, and tom and let them know about it so they can get a head count so that is the report from the executive committee any questions as i said some of those items will you'll be seeing a little later in the agenda okay, seeing no questions okay our next agenda item is uh the uh, appeals policy and i'm going to turn that over to bob great thank you mr chair and uh as Bud tactfully said, the goal here is to wrap this up and, and approve it today, hopefully. Um, there's there's two changes, um, or th this the most recent version of the appeals document was included in supplemental material. Uh, there's two changes that are highlighted in yellow, and then I have one additional change that I'll briefly uh, comment on, but I'll talk about the two uh, changes that were highlighted in yellow. Um, as everyone may remember, at the May meeting, uh, we brought the policy or the appeals policy back to the policy board and there was a suggested change uh, during that meeting and um, the, the the change to reflect that conversation is begins on page three and ends on page four and it, it centers around the idea that if, if as we move through the um, appeal process if the an appeal gets to this policy board and this policy board needs some additional technical information, they can reach out to one of the technical support groups, uh, the you know a technical committee, the assessment science committee, management science committee, whatever it might be, ask for additional um, analysis or information. And the technical support group will get that together as quickly as possible. And we can, and the policy board will revisit the issue at the next quarterly meeting or at an interim meeting between the, the two quarterly meetings. So, that's uh, that's included there, as I said, on page three, going to page four. And then if you look on the other highlighted yellow section on the last page, page five, it's just a recognition that, um, you know, as we go through the appeals process there, the, the management boards and policy board need to keep in mind that some of our FMPs are jointly managed with the Mid-Atlantic Council in particular. And... Uh, just reading the language very quickly. In the case of a jointly managed species, the policy board and the species management board should consider that corrective action could result in inconsistent measures between state and federal water. So this isn't an obligation to consult with one of the councils or anything along those lines. It's just a recognition that you know there is this potential cascading impact um, across these joint FMPs and something to keep in mind when the policy boards are, I mean, when the policy board and species management board is deliberating on uh, what exactly they want to do for corrective action. And then the, um, I've lost it, of course. Okay. The, and the other one that um, I wanted to briefly comment on, it's kind of a write-in change here at the last minute, is at, on, in the, at the end of the first paragraph on page four, there's a sentence that, uh, the last sentence that is actually in a, in a little bit different font, so it stands out. If the policy board requires a management board to take specific correction act, corrective actions. The scope of potential corrective actions must be consistent with the uh, presentation of management options provided to the public in a, in a draft amendment or addendum. And, and this language was approved by the policy board at the last meeting. I think it's all set, but I think we need to add a clause in here that this only obviously applies to issues that went out for public hearing. Sometimes there's, um, uh, you know, conservation equivalency or other, or specification setting or other things that happen at the management board um, can be appealed, and but but they don't have a public hearing record. They don't have a range of options that went, that went out for public hearing. So this sentence kind of shouldn't hamstring the flexibility of a board moving forward for issues that weren't taken out to public comment. So we'll add sort of that clause. So it'll read: If the policy board requires a management board to take specific corrective actions for issues that went out for public hearing, 
the scope of potential corrective actions, et cetera. So just a just a note in there that that sort of limit limited scope only applies to issues that went out for public hearing. So those are the changes. Three of them. Happy to answer any more questions or provide more background if if anyone wants it. All right. Thank you, Bob. All right. Any any questions, Marty Gary? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Bob. I, I think the answer is going to be yes, but I just wanted to be sure I understood it. So hypothetically, in the case of striped bass, if we were to exercise board action um, <clears throat> come this November, uh, hopefully we won't. But if we if we do, if we, and we were to, um, that wouldn't be a, not an addendum process with the public hearings. Would that would your narrative address that? My concern is that's a gray area. The answer is yes. Uh, you know, it, it if the board, if the straight bass board takes corrective actions because the assessment indicates that action is needed and a state felt aggrieved by that action, a state could appeal. And it obviously, as you said, there are no public comment op options or, or um, you know, a range of options wasn't taken out for public comment since the the public and the, and the board agreed to the fast process and in, in, for the, the in Amendment seven. So yeah. Go ahead, Dan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Bob, could you speak to the phrase consistent with? In that um, in the paragraph on page four? Yeah. Yeah. I, it that was a term that I think was debated over and over at the um, executive committee, and that's what they came up with to be to say that it, you know it has to be one of the one of the options um, included in the or, or there's a range of options obviously that go up for public hearing right so it has to be consistent with one of those options or if that document notes that those uh, options can be hybridized then it has to be consistent with that with whatever language we're going to include in any draft documents now the range of options that the boards and policy board have for corrective action are going to be limited to the, that range that's presented at public hearings. Does that help? It does. So it's not necessarily one of the discrete options, but it could be in the range of. Yes. All right. Thank you. Yeah, I sort of think of it as if you have A, B, and D, you could create a C because it's a hybrid of C and a B and D, or some, something sort of sort of like that, but it would be within the sideboards that that had been discussed and, and debated. All right, John Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, as that was one of the things that I was very much in favor of adding to this. Yeah, that's pretty much what I was thinking. But I also wanted us to be clear when we uh, draft an amendment or an addendum to make it clear to the public that that is a possibility, if that is a possibility, if they're discrete options, to put it that way, or if they could be one from column A, one from column B, we make that clear when it goes out for public hearings. Thanks. All right, any other questions about the latest draft of the appeals policy? Is there any opposition to accepting it in the form it's been presented? Speak now or forever hold your peace. So we're ready to put the stamp of approval on this one. I don't see any opposition, so we will consider it approved by unanimous consent. Thank you very much. Okay, we've put the zombie in the ground and got enough dirt on it, hopefully to hold it down. So we'll see next time we have to use it, which I hope is way beyond my tenure as chair. So, so hopefully. All right. Um, our next item is the report from the de minimis work group. And as I said, the executive committee discussed this you know, quite a bit yesterday and, and came up with some preferred options. They certainly are not binding on the policy board, but I think they're, you know, the result of a good dialogue and a good discussion and, and input. And so I'll turn it over to Tony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in your supplemental materials is a draft of a de minimis white paper. Um, the first bit of the um, uh, next slide, Maya. The first bit of the draft just outlines the definition of de minimis and the provision that allows for de minimis within the ISFMP charter for each of the species FMPs. 
Um, the draft policy outlines a set of standards that we could use for each of our species FMPs. Um, it does state that species boards could deviate from these standards to address unique characteristics of a fishery, but those species boards must provide a rationale for why it is deviating from those. Um, and then the Draft also notes that um, federal FMPs do not recognize de minimis standards. Therefore, any de minimis measures implemented in a commission FMP for jointly managed species could result in inconsistent measures between state and federal waters. Sometimes this gets a little tricky um, for evaluating uh, compliance for states when doing that in conjunction with the fishery management councils. In addition, sometimes it becomes confusing for fishermen who fish in state and federal waters but have a federal permit. Um, but the policy does not state what we need to do with that. If the policy board has specific direction, then I can put that into the draft policy. Um, so for each, um, for the minimum standards section, uh, each FMP would, oh, sorry, Maya, next slide. I, did, I haven't been saying this, one more slide. There we go. Uh, each FMP would establish a set of minimum standards for de minimis states. The, it would provide a minimum level of conservation for that species, um, and those minimum standards would also prevent any regulatory loopholes um, for that fishery. The measures for the commercial and recreational fishery could be the same, or you could have minimum standards for each of those species. Next slide, Maya. And for the um, sections that have options, I have highlighted in blue the preferred option from the executive committee. For, uh, so this is thinking about how we designate the fishery, meaning how do we apply de minimis to the commercial and recreational fishery. The first option is to allow each species board to review the provisions and determine how de minimis would be considered on their own. So it would either be commercial and recreational together, they could be separate, or you could have it just for one of the sectors. Option two, which is the preferred option, is the is to separate for commercial and recreational um, sectors, or you could allow it just for one of the sectors. The last option three is a provision as to have the commercial and recreational combine. Next slide, Maya. Next is looking at the thresholds. So. How do you establish de minimis? Um, the first part of it is whether or not you average landings, or this is suggesting we average landings, but for how long? Um, thresholds would be based on the average landings of the previous X number of years. Option one is two years, and the preferred option from the executive committee would be three years. And the, this was suggested because it allows to um, sort of not chase the noise in fisheries and not make you have to react um, back and forth to maybe a, a blip in a fishery change. And it really allows for consistent either increase in landings or consistent decrease in landings um, for a state to be either in or out of de minimis. Next is what percentage of the coastwide landings would allow you to be de minimis. Uh, option one is to task each of the species board's TCs to determine what is an appropriate level that would have a negligible effect on conservation. Option two, which is the preferred option, is uh, that a state landings be 1%, less than 1% of the coastwide landings. And option three is to be less than half a percent of the coastwide landings. And I think that mostly the less than 1% is just somewhat consistent with what we have for most of our species. I recognize that there are some species that have a different percentage 
Um, and as I said before, a species board could consider something different if they have some unique characteristic. And then lastly is looking at sampling requirements. Um, de minimis states can be exempt from sampling requirements. It's important to note that biological samples for the outer edge states could be pretty important for stock assessments, um, in particular um, for all of the states, for data poor species, those samples might be important. It's recommended that the species boards have the stock assessment subcommittee or TC review sampling requirements for de minimis states to determine an appropriate level, if any are important at all. Um, so the intent today is to get direction from the policy board on which options to move forward with. And then I would go back and complete the white paper and bring it back to the policy board for approval in November. And then as species boards make changes to their FMPs, either through addendum or amendments, then we can address any changes that they need to make in their de minimis plans. I think it would be up to a species board um, and their prerogative if they want to take action just on de minimis. They could do so. Um, we could work that into the action plan for, for future years. Uh, the other part that I said that I would work into the white paper is just to note um, the importance of paying attention to the stock status and how um, at times if you were overfished and overfishing was occurring or if you were in a rebuilding program that technical committees may need to take a look at the measures, the, the minimum standard measures or some of the sampling requirements for that species to make sure that it is still having a neg negligible impact or that we're collecting enough information for those species assessments to carry forward when they're in a declining state. It also may impact um, the percent that allows a state to be de minimis because if you have super low levels of catch, 1% may be you know, close to what most states were already catching. All right, thanks, Tony. Let me, I guess, maybe put a little context on what I, I see is the, the practical application of this. And that is, you know, to say, for instance, that we adopted those those preferred options as, as the standards. They, they would be sort of the first filter that a management board and, and its supporting technical committees would use to to apply an analysis of the appropriateness and efficacy of of de minimis. And it, it may be that those entities decide that de minimis is not appropriate because of the unique characteristics of that fishery or that species. Uh, they may uh, decide that it needs to be less than one percent or you know, you may have de minimis for recreational, but not for commercial, but it would be the first thing that you would apply, you know, you, to to that analysis. And that would bring some some level of standardization, because if you look at the supporting table for, for it, it's, it's pretty much all over the place. I mean, we have some plans with no de minimis. We have lobster with a specified amount. It's not a percentage. We, in some, we have, you know, a tenth of a percent. Some, we have a percent. So this would encourage you know at least the application of a standard when, when you're doing the analysis that's sort of the way that i i see this working it isn't going to bind you know a a board or its technical committees to a specific set of parameters but it applies you know a uniform sort of filter to everything so that's kind of what i what i see is this being a practical application so doug you had your your hand raised Yes, sir. thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Tony. Could you go back to the fishery designation slide, please? Yeah, so this may be a benefit of being back in person meetings, or it could be a detriment, but, you know, you have a chance to talk about this over over dinner, and, and I don't, I, several of us were questioning, I guess I'll, I'll take the credit, I, we're questioning the wording and whether it got to where we thought it should be and at least for me i in initiating this request i was looking to 
require each species board to have de minimis for recreational, commercial, and or both. Um, and of the three options that are there as they're written, I don't know that there is a requirement for each species board to have de minimis. You know, once there is de minimis within the board, then the board can choose whether or not it grants de minimis to a state and it has to provide justification why that it can't grant de minimis. But without having that provision there, the state doesn't even have an opportunity to request de minimis. And I just, I don't see the option there. For me, option two, if it were to drop the or for only one sector and in, instead say, or both fisheries together, sort of the way, or both fisheries combined, the way that three reads, to me, that would do it, right? That de minimis for all plans is either considered separately for commercial and recreational or together or combined. And that would, and if that's what we selected, then each species board would be required to have de minimis for each sector. And I just don't know that either of those three get us there. Thank you, Doug. Any, anyone else have similar concerns? Um, Erica? I hate raising my hand to speak just to say the same thing someone else said, so I'll say that I also support what Doug said. Okay. So what, what, what you're recommending, Doug, is that we basically say change option two, provision is separate for commercial and recreational um, or combined. I guess we need to remove the word separate. You could say provision is for commercial or recreational or combined because you really you can't have separate and combined. That kind of they cancel each other out. But uh, well, the, so. the idea would, to me at least would be that the species board would have to have a provision for both sectors, whether they're separate or combined could be up to the species board but they at least have to have provisions for each sector. Okay, um, Tony's going to look into the charter to see, make sure we're not getting crossways with, with something. Um, any other, any, anyone feel like that's the wrong path to go down to, to make that modification? Again, you know, this is, this is, setting sort of a standard you know first first thing that that a, a board has to do to address the, the concept of de minimis and then they move forward uh, making decisions based on the uniqueness of, of that fishery and that species going forward roy mr chairman with regard to doug's suggestion um, how about a fishery like menhaden where there is no recreational de minimis component. Um, I assume that's what the framers of this were thinking when they put or, or for just one in there. So what, what I'm getting at, you can have uh, separate commercial and or recreational de minimis definitions, um, but in, in some cases there may only be a recreational or a commercial de minimis. Right, and I, and I think you know what he's suggesting would allow for that. I would say that board would analyze that fishery based on its attributes, and then and then make the decisions. Obviously, if there's not a recreational component, there would be no point to develop a recreational de minimis. But where you've got mixed use fisheries, you know, it's sort of saying, hey, you need to, you know, at least discuss and attempt to establish these things separate, unless there is a compelling reason why you're not going to do it differently. So, uh, Mel, you raised your hand. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, yeah, I think it's just kind of the semantics here. So if I'm following this, it, it could say provision is for commercial and recreational combined or for just one. And that gives you your options combined. Or if there is no, you know, uh, rec requirement, then it's, it's, one of the, it's one of the others. Is that is that? kind of what you were going? Well, to me, the phrase, or for just one, 
allows a species board to only do one. If there's justification, i.e. menhaden, then it's written in that there's no recreational de minimis because there's no recreational fishery. That makes sense. But again, we go back to bluefish. There's not a recreational de minimis, but yet there's recreational fisheries throughout. And I'm simply trying to ask the bluefish board and other boards where it may come up to consider recreational de minimis. I'm just trying to get that into each plan across the board. All right, Jay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm I'm not um, disagreeing here. I, I thought I'd just offer another um, angle on this. And I, I, I'm having a little difficulty understanding how you might combine them. So maybe it's happening somewhere. Um, and I, I've not seen that yet. But, you know, the notion of having them separate, in my mind, makes sense because the data streams are so different. Even in the case of Menhaden, you could calculate, there are recreational harvests, so you could figure out whether or not you're de minimis based on, on the harvest of uh, recreational harvest of Menhaden in your state. I'm not suggesting we do that. I'm, it could be done, but that's kind of what I'm getting at is, you know, normally for a commercial fishery, you have some sort of a, a quota and, and a, an account census type accounting system. For recreational, you have uh, MREP and, and I guess what I'll say is combining those two things together is not an insignificant task. You'd have to really think it through. Oh, uh, th this maybe this will help clarify a little bit too. Is is really what we're talking about here is, is where we have both. It, it's it's those landings are combined together to generate a number that is then used to to Com compare to the coastwide landings. And so, you know, we use a combination of recreational estimates of recreational landings and reported commercial landings for spot, spotted sea trout, striped bass, weak fish. So what, what Doug is saying is that, you know, you, you analyze them and develop separate criteria. And if you applied that, like we do in, I guess, some fisheries, you would you would have an estimate of recreational landings, and you use that number to compare to the estimate of coastwide recreational landings. You have a a reported commercial landings, and then for a, for a jurisdiction, and you compare that to the coastwide landings, and then that you know you'll you'll either you might be one, you might qualify for both, you might qualify for one and not the other, but uh, sort of that's that's am I capturing the that sort of where we're going with this, but it, the, the intent I think is to, I hate to use the word compel, but to get each management board to at least do the initial analysis where appropriate to have separate criteria for the two fisheries. Because we talked about, we you know we talked about the challenges of using MRIP estimates for recreational and, and the fact that they can, they can be erratic, you know, and you can run into situations where, you know, you're in one year and out the next year, you know, because of the vagaries of, of the way MRIP estimates go. So maybe, maybe could we tweak this a little bit? Again, we're not looking to make final approval of this. Tweak that language. If everybody's agreeable with the intent of what we're trying to accomplish with that language, I think we can perfect it maybe and, and to make sure that it communicates clearly what the intent of that language is and then when we come back at the annual meeting make sure that it is kind of like the appeals policy you know we uh, the turn of a phrase or the meaning of a word you know it makes a big difference and we want to make sure that everybody's comfortable with what where that language takes us so and but i think that the charter itself is specifying and i'm not quite sure if I think it requires de minimis. And, but I think that that's where the charter is what gets at whether or not you require it or not. So that might, maybe, and I need to try to, I'll come back to the work group and let you know, maybe where you require it. And then this language that we're talking about tweaking is just whether or not when you are determining your, um, evaluating your de minimis, are you doing it with the two sectors combined, or are you separating them um, and then determining it? And I guess if you don't have de minimis for one of your sectors, then 
you know, you're not evaluating it, so it's automatically by itself. Uh, are we generally comfortable that we've got something to work from to come back with? Eric Nodger here. Thank you. You're looking pretty somber over there. I was like, <laughs> okay. All right. As far as the other options uh, go, are we comfortable with those other options? Again, you know, you would you would set the one percent standard, but that doesn't mean a management board cannot deviate from that. But it has to have a clear rationale for why it would deviate from that one percent. And it just it just puts a little more onus back on the on the boards, and they're supporting scientific bodies to to you know it's kind of like what, what john was talking about you know make sure we clearly articulate uh in our documents what the outcomes could be or, or why an outcome is what it is so i mean if, if folks are comfortable we can we can work on that and come back at, at the annual meeting and and uh you know have a have a chance to chew on it a little more so everybody okay with that at this point Generally seeing heads nodding. All right. Thumbs up, Merrick. All right. Very good. Okay. Thank y'all. And uh, we'll move on. And Ms. Kearns, you're back on stage for East Coast Climate Change Scenario Planning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I'm going to just let Maya get to this presentation. And next slide, please, Maya. Uh, just as a very quick reminder, um, this is East Coast climate change, uh, yeah, bleh, <laughs> East Coast scenario planning, um, and it is addressing how the East Coast management bodies um, are going to address governance and management issues that are being affected by um, climate change, um, and particularly looking at stock availability and distributions. We are hoping to advance a set of tools and processes that can provide flexible and robust uh, fishery management strategies to continue to promote fishery conservation and resilient fishing communities and address uncertainty in an era of climate change. Next slide, please, Maya. And so where we are in this process, um, we just finished the, um, the scenarios itself, so looking at what will our future look like. And I will go briefly go over those scenarios um, today. And we are moving into the application phase. So this is using the scenarios to identify actions and recommendations for how we make adjustments um, to, to our management process so we can be more flexible in the future. Next slide, please, Maya. Um, so a couple of things that are coming up in terms of our timeline. Uh, we'll be hosting scenario deepening webinars this month, August 17th and August 23rd. The webinars are open to all stakeholders to validate the scenarios that we created. Um, we'll give an overview of the stories from these initial scenarios and allow participants to have the opportunity to give us comments and make suggestions on the scenarios on how to make them more plausible, challenging, relevant, um, memorable, and divergent. Uh, then next, we've added something new to our process. Um, we are going to do um, some fishery manager brainstorming work groups in September. And the purpose of these is to help identify the issues, ideas, and options that should be discussed at scenario planning conversations that we're going to have at both um, all three councils and the commission meetings during the fall. And then those ideas would be presented at the summit meeting in early 23. Uh, the output from these working sessions will ensure that the council and commissions won't be starting from a blank slate at our meetings this fall, but have specific issues to consider and ideas to build on, setting the stage for the summit. And we will be reaching out to folks to see if anybody's interested in participating in these working groups. We're gonna have three, um, three meetings sometime in September, and it'll be intermingling of uh, council and commission um, and some NOAA um, GARFO staff and um, Science Center staff. And 
And then lastly, we'll have the, um, the summit meeting in February. It'll serve as the venue to discuss inputs from the manager um, meetings in the fall with the goal of developing a final set of governance, management, and monitoring requirements for the process. Uh, most of these recommendations are likely to require further development and discussion by the NRCC and individual management groups to address, but um, we're hoping to have a final report after this summit. Um, so the following slides that I'm gonna go over outline the four scenarios that were developed in the June workshop. The scenarios are not predictions, instead they're an outline of what might happen to ocean conditions and stocks and other changes to coastal communities. The scenarios um, contain storylines and suggestions on how fishing industry participants, managers, and other players might adapt, react to, and prepare for such conditions. And the purpose of these scenarios is to act as the platform for conversations on preparing for climate change. Um, so what you'll see um, when I'm presenting is sort of two framework structures, um, and it looks at two critical uncertainties. These are important factors that will likely shape our future, but could develop in unpredictable ways. And the y-axis, which I know this doesn't look like a y-axis, but it doesn't fit on the slide, um, is um, stock production um, replacement in 2024, and it's either you know declining or maintained. And then next slide, Maya, is um, the x-axis, how unpredictable are our ocean conditions and how well does science able to assess and predict stock levels um, by 20, 2040. Um, and on one end of the spectrum, we could have very unpredictable changes and conditions could be low um, and ability to assess is poor or we could have very predictable changes, conditions could be high, and our ability to assess would be good. Uh, next slide, Maya. Um, so the framework that we built here, you'll just see in the different quadrants, um, starting in the upper left-hand side, stocks are maintained, but hard to assess. On the right side, stocks are maintained, and but are really straightforward. Bottom left, stocks decline and are hard to assess. Bottom right, stocks decline, very straightforward, easy to assess. So the story that we created, and I will um, go over this more thoroughly in, in November uh, at our meeting, but in our upper left quadrant, we have our ocean pioneers where the stocks are maintained, but they're hard to assess and predict. Um, in this time, we have crazy ocean conditions, a lot of swinging, booms and busts. The weather is weird, but the ocean is resilient. We don't have any damaging tipping points. Uh, we can have dangerous fishing conditions though, um, but the payoff is still there for many operators and they can still make some money. Uh, the traditional stock assessments are less reliable. Seasons, locations, and genetic diversity have changed considerably. We have real-time data from fishery operators. It becomes more valuable than traditional science. The ocean activity dominated is dominated by entrepreneurs, technology folks, and pioneers. Uh, winners will have deep pockets, um, new technology, and willingness to take risks. And the balance of power in fishery is shifting towards the, op the larger operators. They expect more help from managers as traditional science is not delivering them information. Um, so kind of how long can abundant stocks keep delivering for those big operators? Moving down to our bottom left, we are calling this the stress, fract stress fractures. It's where stocks are declining and are hard to assess. We have very unpredictable conditions that create climate tipping points. Storms create pollution and reduce quality habitat. We have a lot of disease. Um, marine heatways lead to die-offs. There's high stress on fishing operators. 
stock assessments are challenged by insufficient data and the science is unable to help the fishery management community adapt. Cost of fishing uh, gets very high, so profits begin to sink. The government support needed to save domestic fishery, but only a select number of fisheries can get this support. Stocks experiencing rain shifts are incorrectly classified as overfished and these false flags undermine the management process. And fishing no, fishing no longer is a dominant activity in the ocean, um, competing with other industries for space and labor. So it's kind of a gloom and doom corner. <laughs> uh, then moving over to the bottom right, we're calling this the managing decline. Um, science is good, but the news is still bad. We have warming trends with declining productivity. The maximum fish size is smaller. The cold pool breaks down. We have rain shifts as species move north and east, but not much range expansion. The science is effective and predictive, but its findings are not always great news. Agriculture becomes very prevalent as a source for seafood, and we have effective management um, puts limits on newly arriving species, allowing for the establishment of reproducing prop populations um, as they move into different areas. Therefore, we have successful small-scale fishermen that can adapt to some reduced catch limits and these new stocks that are coming into their area. We have uns um, unsuccessful regions have not protected newly arriving stocks, resulting in an industrialization of the fleet and competition from imports and aquaculture. We have um, the upper right hand corner is checks and balances. Um, in this, we have predictable changes and tolerable conditions. Uh, the range expansion as many stocks move predictably north and in east. Advances in habitat protection and climate mitigation are good for fishing and coastal communities. Um, disease is only apparent in a limited number of stocks. Science effectiveness improves and is delivering effective ocean monitoring. Real-time fisheries are reporting and food web is and population monitoring is going well. Carbon emission growth has been limited and um, pollution is under control. The species composition has changed, but management can provide a full and flexible balanced use of the fish stocks. There is investment in other ocean uses and coastal uses that provide economic bounty to coastal communities. And the recreational sector is healthy thanks to stable productivity and increased coastal wealth. So that is our like super positive corner. <laughs> Um, so as we move forward, we'll provide more information for these different scenarios that are presented here. And what we're asking for management bodies to do is think about, okay, if we're if we move to any of these corners, how do we really need to be more adaptable and flexible in our management process in order to travel down one of these paths? What it's not necessarily that we want to know how we change specific measures for this particular species, but it's how does our process work? How do we interact with um, other states? How do we interact with the fishery management councils to make these changes? So thinking about big picture um, switches or maybe some stuff still works and we don't have to make those changes that's all i have well after that cheerful presentation um <laughs> <laughs> uh, i think we'll just end the meeting there and we'll just uh go on home and enjoy what time we have left so <laughs> so whew. Uh, anyway seriously <laughs> all right oh, oh, sorry i forgot i do have okay We've got time. I want to give you a short shift. I figure maybe you're going to put a positive spin on yeah. this at the end. All right. I don't want to miss that slide. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. All right. I saw several hands. Let's see. I've got Dan, uh, Jim Gilmore, Tom Fody, uh, Lauren. All right. Go ahead, Dan. Tony, um, 
Do you think that there's appetite to try to amend laws? I mean, we've talked about it as a core team is that that is, you know, something that might need to happen or that we at least identify if we want to be able to prepare for the future, these laws need to be changed to allow for X, Y, or Z. So it, you know, it can be a recommendation that comes out of the, the group. Whether or not the appetite is there, it's hard to predict. All right, Jim Gilmore. Thanks, Chairman. Uh, Tony, and that was great. Uh, I, I'm, I'm serious. That was very, very, really well done because uh, it really kind of, as much as FUD said, it was depressing and it really does kind of show a big picture what's going on. So, and that's actually following up what Dan just said. So, um, I think for ASMSC managed species, this is great, but then we get to our jointly managed species and the examples we've had the last couple of years where I think the commission could have fixed some things, um, like maybe a species like black sea bass, but it's a joint species. And Magnuson says no, so that's the end of the story. And if we want to fix it, it's going to take us probably one to two years because of the federal process. So um, it, uh, same thing. It's like we really, um, a big part of this moving forward is that, you know, Magnuson has not had a major update since 2007. So we, we didn't really have climate change when they were writing that version. We didn't, you know, the whole thing's about allocations, governance. All that stuff was really not a major issue. And, um, you know, if we're going to move forward on this, that is a, an important thing to get fixed. And, and, you know, granted, Bob said it yesterday, nothing's happening on Magnuson this year. And it's been going like that for several years now. Well, we're just going to be in this endless loop of, well, Magnuson says no, so we can't do anything about it. So just as a recommendation, I think we need to be a little bit more broad than just bringing Garfo on in this. I think at some point headquarters really needs to come into this. We are going to all be meeting in San Diego in 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 uh, November or whatever. And I'm not sure if this is ready for prime time, but we really need to start having those discussions and even the suggestion about maybe some of the key gov uh, federal government elected folks, their staff to be involved with this because when we get to the end of this, if we've got this great document that says, here, how's how we fix it? And then we go, well, but Magnuson says no. So um, we're just going to be spinning our wheels. So uh, just some suggestions and a, an important thing to do. But we really got to look at the end game of when we get to the end of it, are we going to have any impact? Thanks. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, Tony's got a response to that. So, Jim, just don't forget that this isn't just GARFO. It's, uh, we're doing this with all three management councils, GARFO, the Science Center, headquarters staff, uh, the Southeast region. So we have all entities involved. In addition to that, um, the NOAA headquarters did present uh, a climate policy strategy that they are, or governance strategy that they are initiating. Um, we are hoping that they will use the recommendations that come out of this scenario planning process to help guide their policy. Um, I do see that Mike Ruscio has his hand up on the webinar, Spud, if he wants to. I'm not sure if that's what he would be getting at, but Mike, I've unmuted you. You just have to unmute yourself. Okay, thanks. Uh, hope everybody can hear me and uh... Apologies for not being there in person. We had a little COVID on our vacation last week, uh, so better to spare you all from exposure. But, you know, Tony really stole most of my thunder, uh, why I shot my hand up. But, you know, Jim and Dan, I appreciate your comments. This is something that we are both involved with, uh, the actual scenario planning for the Atlantic coast, um, and engaged with kind of on a national and broad scope and scale. Uh, we are, you know, continuing to think about and and have a number of kind of efforts. Tony mentioned one being you know looking at governance, and we're we're trying to not get in the way of scenario planning uh, and see what they kind of come up with for government's recommendations, but also cognizant that governance can be really tri tricky and difficult to navigate. And if if we need to kind of stand behind the process and provide additional guidance, we're we're ready and, and poised to do that. But you know we're we have a number of efforts, I guess I would say, that are underway that are looking at shifting distribution, changes in climate, 
and really to the key point that I think you were raising, Jim, uh, does Magnuson play well in that sandbox or not? And you know, where we have limits in terms of what we can do and how we can influence things like reauthorization. But we've we've had, you know, you may have seen Janet last year up on the hill when we had the Huffman field hearing. Um, we've had continual conversations with a number of our authorizing committees uh, in both the Senate and House side. So this is something that we're you know actively engaged in, uh, both public facing and behind the scenes, and you know happy to have more conversation about it if, if that's helpful. Thank you, thank you, Mike. <clears throat> All right, uh, Tom Fody. Yeah, I got two points. One, after listening to Jim and listening to him on the phone. I'm thinking that maybe the annual meeting would be a good time to invite some legislators in to have a workshop during one of those particular times. I know Congressman Pallone wants to come come over because he's going to give us a greeting, but wouldn't it be better if we basically sat around and talked about this and the Magnuson Stevens Act and where we were? If that's what you presumed, I will try and set that up. But yeah, and get a, one of our senators or anybody else that would like to send staff. You know, it might be an opportunity where we would do something like that. So that was my first point. The second point is I've just gone through a three-year process with Rutgers University and DEP mapping the state of New Jersey. So what do we do with aquaculture and where would be the areas that might possibly be used as, as the water rises in New Jersey? Spent a lot of time, a lot of money, but the, the amazing stuff is the USGIS, all the information that we put in there. You can put 60 overlo, uh, overlays on these maps now of the state of New Jersey. Um, I mean, Joe could probably talk about it a little more than I, but I've been through the process. It's out in draft form, but that's what I can imagine what most states are beginning to look at. Where's the fishing areas? And I'm talking about it at Mayfair because I sit on their climate change committee. But it's really all state waters that I'm talking about, mostly, but it does give some parts to the federal waters where the fishing grounds are. But it's interesting, look, as the water rises, what are we going to lose? Where we actually can move docks to, where we're going to have aquaculture beds. And uh, we could share that with the commission. It's still in draft form, but we're about completing that. I mean, Joe, do you have anything to follow up on that? No, I don't have anything. We're close. Yeah, we're close. And it, it was a lot of work and really like, I'm going to thank a lot of people for doing that. But and if you want, I will get involved in this committee that you're basically putting together. Hey, I, yeah, I think that'd be a good prompt for Tony to maybe talk about what we're going to do at the annual meeting regards the scenario planning. So, Tom, I don't know if we would have time for such a workshop at the annual meeting, but at the annual meeting, we will be as a commission sitting down and talking about what types of recommendations do we think are needed to... Um, change our governance, and that is our governance, you know, council, NOAA, what what do we think needs to change in order to respond to any of these future scenarios? So it might be something that you want to invite them to, to, to listen to, um, but we will be spending a fair amount of time together discussing and being uh, bringing forward recommendations that we can then take to this summit meeting where all of the bodies will get together and try to bring something forward. Um, and we will have some seed ideas that come out of these brainstorming sessions that we're going to do um, with the different um, folks from all of the, the bodies involved. Um, all right, thanks. All right, uh, Lauren. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Tony, for a very interesting and informative report. Uh, you certainly used uh, correctly the terms gloom and doom. Uh, and uh, in, in speaking of the managing the decline, uh, you did bring up the uh, the concept of uh, aquaculture, and uh, I would be interested in learning a lot more about uh, about aquaculture and probabilities for ramping up th th those processes uh, as they become more sophisticated, uh, increased efficiency, uh, expanding. But I, I would wonder, is that only gonna provide a tiny fraction of what the public has been used to uh, in terms of um, the, the uh, availability of seafood for consumption? Uh, even under the best scenario, is it still just a very tiny fraction? Thank you. 
Yeah, I mean that's that's a that's a big subject, and, and I think you know there there's I think we all know there's some potential, but obviously the species diversity that's put on the tables of America would change drastically if we had to shift over to to aquaculture based. I mean, just you know personally, I mean there it wasn't too long ago I was skeptical that anybody would eat tilapia. Now you can go to just about any restaurant and you see t tilapia on the menu. So, but you know, that's, that's not necessarily a substitute for red snapper, but you know, it is what it is. So, but that's, that's a big subject. And, you know, perhaps in one of our future meetings, that's something we can delve a little deeper into, you know, for the, for the benefit of the commission. So Eric. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You should pick a different restaurant. In, in my opinion, that, that's the first thing. Um, I'm not really sure where to start. This is a big topic, but I'll start uh, with saying that the the scenario planning workshop was two days or three days. It was held up the street, and Jonathan Starr was the uh, facilitator. He did a fabulous job. There was 70 something people in that room, and uh, and he really did a great job, so he should be absolutely commended. And, you know, it's interesting that the scenarios are not all doom and gloom, but that's what everybody that's what they heard was all doom and gloom. Well, there's depending on how you want to spin that compass, so you can have a lot of them. But, but my my concern is I, I get a lot of concerns and I and I don't want to have a half full glass, but, you know, we might as well talk about it. One is. Um, when we had the CCC meeting in May, was it in May? I don't remember when it was. Anyway, the commission is not in on that, but that's when the feds rolled out their idea about this scenario planning. <clears throat> they have a, they have their own effort that, uh, no offense, Mr. Ruccio, my friend Mike, uh, but I am not sure if those efforts are running in parallel or they're going to intersect at some point. Um, th that's unclear to me. And we really didn't know a lot about that development of the feds idea until it was rolled out in front of the ccc and i don't think people were all that thrilled about it so we ha you have these two two things happening at once and i am not sure if the goal for each is the same so that's the first thing so we have to consider that the second thing is the timing of this in in my mind is way it, the, the, the timeline not the timing the time timing is fine but the timeline is really i think uh that's a pie in the sky uh, we have our meeting new england has our meeting in september the end of september and we have to put this on our agenda but we got a lot going on in that meeting you know we might be able to squeeze an hour and a half to talk about it and then our next meeting is in is until december so that the effective input of our council on this is not going to be that great because, you know, when, when Tony did her presentation, which he did a great job, Tony, I'm looking around the room and people are going, what the hell am I looking at here? And, you know, my council is going to have a lot of questions and they're going to want to talk about it, but an hour and a half isn't going to cut it. But that's all we have. That's the reality of it. Um, you know, Bob, you, you were in the, in the scenario planning. I don't know how much staff time you have for this. New England, you know, our staff is busy. And, and to, you know, this new, the, the management working group, I mean, I, I don't know where it's going to all fit in. And to get this done by February, I, I think that's extremely ambitious. And fast is usually the opposite of good. So I, I just, I, I think that we really have to look at what input you want, you know, you want to fast. Okay, fine. But it's not going to be good. That's, that's my opinion. Uh, but, you know, it's really at this point, this is theoretical fisheries management that want, that is going to be applied in a very near future. And that worries me. You know, the, the feds are concerned about how to change management governance on species that shift. Uh, we're looking, we're, we of course have different stakeholders that we have to, be accountable to and we have to we have to take our time and do a good job so i mean bob i don't know if you want to speak to what your your staff time looks like 
you know, certainly I'm not the executive director of New England, but I got a pretty good idea what our timeline looks like, and it is not going to meet what's on what what has been presented today. So I, I, I'd rather do I'd rather do good than fast. That's my opinion. Great. Thanks for the invitation, Eric. Yeah, you know, this came along at a great time because Tony was sitting around, <clears throat> really didn't have anything to do, so it gave her something to do. So it worked out pretty well for us. But no, I, I mean, yeah, everybody's flat out busy. You know, and as Tony mentioned a minute ago or alluded to, you know, our, our annual meeting first week of November is, you know, looking at that agenda, there's some pretty big things on there. You know, Horseshoe Crab that came out yesterday and Menhaden, and those are all going to take a lot of time responding to um, getting the striped bass stock assessment and others. So, I, you know, we're not going to have a half day or, or a full day to set aside and have this conversation that I think is needed to really dig into this and figure out collectively among 15 states where you want to go and how, you know, what, what feedback do you want to give on the interactions with the councils? It's a, it's complicated. If it was, you know, if it was easy, we would have done it a long time ago. Um, so, you know, I think we're in the same spot. It's, it's busy. It's an ambitious schedule, but we'll, you know, I, I think keep pushing is, is important. Um, and, you know, it, it we're in a spot where, you know, you mentioned the two tracks that are going on, the federal activities on governance policy and, and this scenario planning. And, and the part I don't know is kind of how we fit into that federal process. You know, we're, we're the commission, right? So we're kind of out on our own. And and the ASMSC chiming in on Magnus and Stevens change, potential changes is, is a little bit awkward. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't really guide what ASMSC does, but it, indirectly it does. Uh, so there's there's a lot of pieces here that need to be worked through and you know i'm not sure exactly where we find all the time to do it yeah i appreciate your your comments eric i mean you know it's a it's some you know when this first was even conceptualized i was thinking wow i mean we're <laughs> i mean it is uh an ambitious undertaking um trying to look into a future that none of us can see into but trying to make plans for that so uh but as far as you know our our role i mean as, as bob said is is kind of we obviously have a vested interest in, in what happens you know I, I have to frequently remind folks nobody lives in the eez <laughs> they live in our states and so they 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 look to the states to represent their interest and um you know that's we're we're a good uh body to do that so we have we have a member of the public who has uh, been very patient and had their hand up and I'm going to at this time use my discretion to afford him a couple of minutes for a a comment and then we will move on to Dr. John Hare uh, for our next agenda item. Uh, Jim Fletcher, I've unmuted you on my end, you just need to unmute yourself. I found it interesting sitting here. We talk about aquaculture in the last few minutes, and yet the federal government does not have the aquaculture plan. And when in North Carolina, we tried to put aquaculture in the EEZ, Coast Guard, Corps of Engineers, everything was used to stop it. They didn't have a policy, but they stopped it. Now, on Menhaden, no one mentioned the hybrid menhaden and do we have the ability to do stock enhancement to raise and release breed eggs from there up every one of these species i hear them talk about science but we are not doing anything to enhance the species for the last 20 years we have ignored the science of B-O-F-F-F, -F, which stands for big, old, fat, fecund female fish. If the models the staff is using were correct, they should have pointed out that we should have been leaving the largest fish. The United National Fishermen's Association has argued for God knows how long to stop killing the large summer flounder, the females, and yet, ASMFC and the council has managed for the prestigious elite and the prestigious elite is sitting around the table are those that can afford a 20 to 30 foot vessel and a pickup truck to buy it or private property to put the boat behind so that they don't have to report. 
ASMFC has the chance to recommend cell phone reporting so we don't have to say, oh, we don't have the data. My question is, and it's very simple, are we managing fish for food or are we managing fish for sport? All right, Mr. Fletcher, thank you. We're going to appreciate your comment. But we need to we need to move along. So thank, thank you for that comment. We appreciate it. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, as I've sit in, sat here listening to the comments um, around the issues of scenario planning and climate and, and the timing issues that Eric Reed brought up, it, it may behoove the executive committee to talk a little bit about this and even consider maybe a day um, uh, for the commission in a special meeting to talk more about this because these issues of, um, of changing laws, the governance components of this all impact the work that we're going to do here so it may be worth especially considering the time frames that they're talking about rolling up our sleeves and having a, a broad conversation about it thank you you want to host that up in maine for us some beautiful island somewhere i, I, do, I do have an island i'm not sure all of us would fit but, yeah. uh, <laughs> okay <laughs> okay all right good idea and it's something certainly something because it, it it's not something we need to give short shift and i, and I think that's the challenge is we've got you know, we're like jugglers that are really good, but, you know, even the best juggler in the world can only juggle so many balls at a time. So, uh, and we're always pushing the boundaries. So with that, I'm going to our next uh, agenda item and call on Dr. John Hare to uh, do a review of NOAA Fisheries Climate Ecosystem Fisheries Initiative. Thank you, Dr. Hare. Welcome. Thank you very much. And it's good to be here. Um, you know, I'm going to introduce the Climate Ecosystem and Fisheries Initiative, but it, I'm, you know, I'm glad I have the opportunity to follow Tony because, you know, you just heard about climate scenario planning and part of those scenarios is sort of the decrease in the effectiveness of science to inform decision making. Um, and that's what we, um, you know, sort of NOAA Fisheries Science, NOAA Science in general have been working hard to sort of counter that. Um, and so our goal is to improve the science that we can provide to you to help you make the decisions you need to make. And that's where this climate ecosystem and fisheries initiative really came out of, was this in interest and intent in NOAA improving the science that we make available to you. Um, so again, climate ecosystem and fisheries initiative, um, the, the, you know, the vision is building the decision support system needed for climate resilient fisheries ecosystems and coastal communities. Um, and you can think about this as you know, climate models to science advice to decision makers. Um, so I'm just gonna step through a little bit of detail about it just to, so you're aware that we are working to improve our science. Next slide, please. So what is the Climate Ecosystem and Fisheries Initiative? It's a cross NOAA effort to provide climate informed advice to reduce risks and increase resilience of marine resources and the many people and businesses that depend on them. So cross NOAA, it's the uh, oceanic and atmospheric research part of NOAA, which is the climate modeling part. It's NOAA Fisheries, which I think many of you know well. It's also the National Ocean Service. So we're working together uh, to try to develop this uh, climate fisheries ecosystem, climate ecosystem fisheries initiative. Um, so what are we going to do? How are we going to do this? Um, our intent is to build end-to-end -end ocean decision support system uh, using expertise across NOAA um, and management partners, including Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, to provide robust predictions, forecasts, and projections of future marine ecosystems, including human dimensions, how humans intersect and, and use those ecosystems. And we very much view this as a scientific initiative, which is going to improve your ability to make decisions. So users, Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission is, you know, an integral part of this initiative. Um, and the intent is to inform existing management pathways um, that include the Marine Fisheries Commission's uh, regional offices within NOAA, uh, the Fisheries Management Councils, Marine Sanctuaries, among others. Next slide, please. And so this is a complicated figure. Um, it's just think of it more as conceptual. Um, we view three intersecting parts of this initiative. 
Uh, on the left is the, you know, the development of science, research, modeling, observations. The middle is developing the operational capacity to provide that science, so operational climate models uh, using uh, you know, standard data formats and sort of an open uh, information hub where anyone can go and get climate model output. And then on the right side is the engagement and extension where we are working actively with you, with other management partners to use this operational science, climate-informed operational science. Next slide, please, Tony. And so just to give you a, like a little more tangible idea, um, uh, uh, oceanic and atmospheric research, the climate modeling part of NOAA, has already developed regional climate model grids. Um, so they've developed a West Coast regional climate model, an Arctic regional climate model, an East Coast regional climate model, and a Great Lakes regional climate model. And the intent is to use these regional high resolution climate models to inform the science that we are providing to you. Um, and then we, next slide please. These model results will be provided through uh, a data portal which is already in existence. So uh, Physical Sciences Laboratory in Boulder is already providing climate model output uh, to anyone. Um, these are sort of the current class models. They're about a degree in resolution, so you know, 60 nautical model, 60 nautical miles. Uh, these high-resolution regional grids that have been developed are five to ten uh, nautical miles, so higher resolution, uh, which is important in terms of getting the climate right for a particular region. So we have the climate models under development. We have this information hub under development. Next slide, please. And then what the initiative envisions is that each region will have a team of scientists who are trained in using the climate model output and are working with you to develop science advice that you need to make decisions. And we call these decision support teams. So depending on the, on the user, um, those decision support teams could link the climate models to habitat and distribution maps. They could link those climate models to species forecast and projections. They could link those climate models to ecosystem-wide forecasts and projections. They could link those climate models to a tipping point and threshold analyses. And then some of the applications that come out of those analyses are scenario planning, risk assessments, uh, ability to help with rapid responses, uh, consultation in the regulatory review processes, management strategy evaluation, and the you know rebuilding and recovery plans. Next slide, please. And just want to emphasize, you know, we had the conversation about climate scenario planning. Um, out of that effort, there. Oh, go back one, please. Um, out of that effort, um, there's going to be some ideas about what management actions could be taken or what governance changes could be made, or what legislative changes can be made. And so the intent of this initiative is to be able to provide the climate-informed science advice that you will need to take those steps uh, you know, using this best science available. Next slide, please. And so where are we with this initiative? Um, we're putting the pieces together, as you've seen. Uh, we've had it reviewed by the NOAA Science Advisory Board, and they reviewed it very favorably. Um, we've requested $20 million in the NOAA FY23 budget request, um, $10 million to NOAA Fisheries, and $10 million to OAR. Um, we recognize that we need to do this, um, and we recognize that we need new resources to do this. Um, so that's where this budget request has come from. We're going to continue our pilot projects. We have one in the Northeast. Uh, one on the West Coast, one in the Gulf of Alaska, and one in the Bering Sea. I'm happy to talk about those if there's interest. Um, and we're engaging with National Ocean Service in the planning and program engagements um, and working to communicate this to our external partners, including Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. Um, and then we're updating our build-out plans for FY23 and beyond. Um, and we also understand that there is the need for additional observational and research activities, and so we're starting to do the planning there. Um, but that's it, all I have for my presentation today. Again, the intent is to improve the science that you're able to use in making climate-informed decisions. So happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hare. Any, any questions for John? 
Jay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thanks, Dr. Hare. That that's um, awesome. Uh, and so I wonder, like, just I'll focus in on one element: is the idea, um, in so you know, thinking about, I think it was like the third little icon down, um, you know, stock assessments and projections, is the idea that you would have this team that might look at you know a, a stock assessment and it's probably just a standard statistical catch at age model and, and they would build either create a model that could incorporate um, climate information just for sake of argument temperature maybe impacts on on recruitment um, so hopefully you get the gist of of what i'm getting at but is the idea that you would have a team that might take the existing um, tools that are being used and modernize them, you know, to kind of provide this, um, you know, climate element into the information that's produced out of out of that process. Or is this something that's a little has a longer arc than that? Something um, that's not quite as immediate as as I started thinking about it. Um, I think it's in the immediacy. Um, and so, again, all the pieces, you know, we've been trying to sort of advance climate-informed advice for a number of years, uh, climate science strategy in 2015, building on that. So in the Northeast region, I think we're in an excellent place to start taking advantage of this immediately. Um, there's the Woods Hole assessment model, which is a state-based model, which can include environmental components um, in any number of parameters. Um, and what we have been missing in applying that model to projections is the environmental projections of what the future will be. Um, so the climate modeling, the high resolution climate modeling will provide that environmental forecast going forward that we can then link to this existing Woods Hole assessment model to provide climate informed projections in the stock assessment arena. Um, and there are other examples where we can play that sort of scenario out, but using our current tools in the immediate and then using that to help build momentum to, to you know, further advance those tools and bring new tools on board. So I really see this as a, a helping now um, and in the future initiative. Any other questions for Dr. Hare? No, Sandy, thank you for, for being here. We look forward to it. It's, it's another ambitious undertaking, but certainly one that's going to be vitally important for us to move forward and make the best decisions we can. So thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. All right. Uh, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to our resident guru of risk and uncertainty, Dr. McNamee, uh, for his presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, um, I, I was thinking self-appointed risk and uncertainty czar, if, if that's okay. Um, so uh, thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. I, I've got a presentation here. Um, it's it's a little long, and it's stuff you've all seen maybe more than once at this point. So I'm going to kind of cruise through it. Um, the point of what we're you know kind of giving you this update for is to start thinking about um, a couple of questions, which I'll kind of pose up front, and then again uh, at the back end of the presentation. Is is Maya controlling the slides? Thank you so much, Maya. And you can flip to the next one. So um, yeah, just a we'll kind of cruise through a couple things in this presentation, a little bit of background, just to um, you know maybe you're thinking about risk and uncertainty incessantly like me, but uh, if not, I'll kind of reintroduce it. Um, we'll talk about the Tatog pilot case that we went through, and then these are the questions that we want to kind of focus in on at the end, and we're just trying to find a path forward uh, here on this. So some next steps. Um, do you want us to conduct another pilot case? Um, you know, what about a data poor version of this? Do you want us to kind of look, start looking into that? We've been generally, we've been dealing with uh, data rich uh, situation so far um, should we be looking at only asmfc managed species um, and then you know could we broaden this out so so far we've been kind of talking about it in the context of reference points and projections but um, this could be broadened a little bit so 
those are the questions. So I'm introducing them to you now and we'll put them back up at the end. Uh, next slide. So just recall that the draft risk and uncertainty, we've got a policy and a decision tool. And the point of all of that is to get us to an appropriate and kind of defined and transparent risk tolerance uh, level for some sort of a management um, decision. And so one important distinction is this isn't management strategy evaluation. It's a little different. This isn't a tool to kind of look at management um, idea one and management idea two and kind of look at the trade-offs. That is not what this is. That would be a management strategy evaluation. This is more to get us um, to a point where we can make a more informed decision about, you know, generally what we offer as a starting point is we want a 50% probability of, of reaching the reference point, for instance. Um, and then sometimes uh, we'll kind of throw in a continuum, but it's not um, thought about in the context of, it is thought about in the context of risk, but how we're getting to these numbers is not very transparent. So that's the point of uh, this, um, the tool that we're using. Next slide. Just a schematic uh, of what the tool is. You've got a series of technical inputs there on the box on the, if you're looking up at the screen, the left, uh, that go in. And then on the right hand, top right hand side, you have a series of weightings. Um, and so that is the management board's opportunity to say, this one's important and this one is less important. And so we kind of weight these things in the model, um, grind it all up in the tool and out pops a, a risk tolerance um, out of the the tool and so again that's the usually the goal probability of achieving a reference point is what we've been kind of focused on it's a, a simple one to kind of think about next slide so when we're looking uh you know we've gotten a stock assessment and we get some projections um and so what we're often looking at is you know a uh, point estimate, which is usually just kind of the center of a, a distribution of uh, some uncertainty in these projections. So we'll conduct like a thousand runs with these uncertainties and you get these different potential um, outcomes. Right in the center of it is um, usually the, the value that we kind of focus in on. Next slide. And so a kind of a default that we use a lot is to say we are going to um, use 50% uh, probability. And basically what we mean by that is, so in the case of fishing mortality, you're going to take that uncertainty around the center and you're going to split half of it will be uh, above that point estimate and half of it will be below it. So you have equal probability of being above or below um, that uh, the middle of all of all of that uncertainty. Next slide. Often what we want to do though is modify that a little bit depending on the situation that we're in with a particular species. And so, you know, the question we often wonder is, well, what's better, a higher or a lower probability? And so in the case, if we wanted to be more conservative, what we would do is we would set a 60% probability. And what we mean by that is all of that uncertainty around uh, that you see up there in these different shades of blue, those are all potential outcomes given the uncertainties that we have uh, in the species that we're looking at in the projections. And what we're saying is we want 60% of those potential outcomes to be in the good zone, so below, the um, the F you know target that we're looking at, and a smaller number of those, 40% will be above it. So there's still a chance that you're going to be above your uh, the reference point of where you want to be, but more of the probability is putting you in the zone where you want to be. So that's just a, a quick you know trip through the the probability discussion that we often uh, have uh, when we're trying to um, decide what to do with these projections that we get from stock assessments. 
Next slide. So we did a TATOG pilot case. Um, and again, the, uh, the TATOG situation is there's four regional um, areas for four regions for for the Tatog fishery and you can see them up there and so um, this is another schematic so we had um, the Tatog the Tatog board got together uh, and we did some online surveying and and we came up with these weightings so that's a process that we kind of worked on with the Tatog board it seemed to work pretty good um, and so we might try and implement that again. And then we had the technical inputs that came in from the stock assessment folks and the uh, Committee for Economic and Social Science. Uh, they weighed in to fill in those technical inputs and then we produced a goal probability. Next slide. And so there's kind of two phases. Uh, phase one is the development of the decision tool, which is species specific as we have it crafted now. And we did all that for Tatog, so that was great. And then we were ready to move into phase two, which is after you develop the decision tool, you wanna use it. And so we got to that um, phase two and uh, next slide. Um, what happened was we had the uh, unfortunate situation of good stock status for Tatog across all of the, uh, uh, all of the regions and so uh, there was no management action needed for TATOG, um, so it kind of blew up our, our pilot test case here. Um, uh, so what we did instead was we said, well, okay, we can make believe. So uh, we provided a couple of different hypothetical scenarios just to kind of show what could have happened with TATOG had the news been bad and not good. Next slide. And so uh, just another schematic. So we, we got through phase one, we did all of those boxes and we um, ended up producing some projections. And because we didn't have kind of a real world um, situation to work with because there was no management action that was triggered by the um, outcome of the last TATOG assessment. Uh, next slide. We developed these hypothetical scenarios and, and the main things we looked at were you know, no difference uh, in uh, if we needed no difference in harvest or if we needed, you know, between five and 10, um, you know, a reduction of five to 10% in, in uh, harvest for Tatog. Next slide. And so uh, we were able to do that. Um, and this is what came out of that so this these are the these were the goal probabilities this was without the socioeconomic um consideration so it includes everything uh it, all the technical elements of stock status information um all of these different types of uncertainties that we wanted to incorporate ecosystem importance and this is where we um, came out as that table on the bottom there. So for the Master Rhode Island region, we were at 54%. Um, and so these are the goal probabilities. So were we to take management action, this is where we would want to kind of end up. And just for reference, TATOG is one of these um, cases where the default is 50%. So you can see in the case of Master Rhode Island, we would have wanted to be slightly more risk averse um, in that situation, if you were talking about uh, fishing mortality. Next slide. So um, again, we did a couple of scenarios of different potential changes in harvest levels. And the other thing we did was we um, used some alternate uh, weightings for the socioeconomic components. So the board went through a, a weighting um, process and, and we got those directly from the board and what we did here was we showed you just to show the effects of the tool and, and what could happen we changed those up a little bit just to kind of um, to show you uh, what the potential outcome is next slide and so uh, this table just shows you that I think the take home here I won't walk through all of it I, I did that last time we talked about this um, it's there and I'm happy to answer, answer any questions on it if you have any, but the, what I want you to do is look up there, look at the numbers and notice that even with, in some cases, some pretty dramatic changes to like the weightings or um, the amount of harvest reduction, 
those risk probabilities don't change all that much, a couple of percentage points here and there. And so the point is, you know, you're not going to get wild swings uh, in this stuff um, outside of those, the technical inputs. So, you know, I think some people were worried in the discussions we've had on this about kind of un, um, instability, you know, you're going to get wild swings. And, and so what we found in this hypothetical situation is no, you know, a couple of percentage points, which can be meaningful, of course, but, you know, not like 10 to 15 to 20 percent, you weren't getting wild swings like that. Next slide. Okay, I got through it all. So um, I will stop there. That was kind of a trip through where we've been. And uh, if you go to the next slide, Maya, here, here are those questions again. And we had to, so you could read them. We put them on to, to two slides here. So we'll kind of flip back and forth, but we're basically looking for a little guidance. And there's kind of like two main paths that we could go down here. You could say, hey, Jay and Sarah, please do some more um, pilot cases, you know, do some more testing before we uh, adopt this. Or we could go ahead and move forward with adoption, not today, um, but if that was something you were interested in, I think between now and even the annual meeting, I could confer with Sarah um, and we could kind of scope out what that looks like and, and come back to you to, to sort of, um, you know, give you at least our idea of what kind of finalizing this would look like and then how it would move forward um, from there. And the reason I pose it that way is, you know, there's really not anything coming up in the very near future. And so my my fear, personal fear is, you know, Red Drum is like one we could potentially, you know, test. Um, and that's one of the earlier ones and that's 2024. And um, what, you know, if we wait until then and, and we don't talk about this again until then, I'm gonna have to go through this whole presentation again and walk you through all the stuff that we did. Um, so, you know, I, I'm just, it's been a long time that we've been working on this already and, and this would push it out um, even further, but um, understandably, and, and this was the advice we got after the, the Tatog version was, you should test it on another species. The problem is that the next species is kind of a ways off. Um, so we're looking for, you know, guidance on move forward or uh, do another test and then, um, there's a, a notion of how about data poor species? We haven't really tinkered with that yet at all. Um, there, again, there's nothing on the horizon that would give us sort of a real world version of that, but we could, um, we're good at make believe, so we could kind of um, come up with something. And then next slide, um, a couple of, of remaining questions there. Like, should we just be thinking about this? Um, you know, the jointly managed species, they have their own risk policy already built in. So maybe we don't need to do anything there, although I would suggest maybe it could be valuable in some of the, um, the specification work that we do at the commission with regard to the jointly managed species, which I don't think would necessarily interfere uh, with the existing risk policy. Um, and again, you know, so far, what we've worked on have been uh, kind of data rich situations. Uh, so another one, you know, we could test it out on a data poor situation as well. So Mr. Chair, that's it uh, for me. Hopefully that didn't take too long and happy to take any questions. Thank, thank you, Jay. <clears throat> questions, uh, Lynn? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Jason, it's great. It's It's just really, fun to see this go into implementation. And I have a few questions. And the first one is, um, in the Tatog example, so that the decision tool was created, uh, but you didn't get to implement because you didn't have to because stock status was fine. So the question is, how long does that decision tool stay in play? So is it is it in play for the next assessment? Is it done? Or would it is the idea that it would be rerun every time a new management action happened? That's an awesome question. And I and I don't know that we've talked too much about that. So I suppose it, it 
this has a shelf life. I, I don't know that it's a super long shelf life, but there's no reason to think that you would have to redo, for instance, the weightings over and over again, unless there w was some impetus to. So maybe what could happen prior to a management decision is just a quick half an hour review of those weightings to see if they still make sense to people, or maybe the situation has changed and, and you wanna, wanted to tweak one. Um, and we could have that discussion at the board. And that was always the intent is that we're having these discussions that get recorded. We know why we, you know, change these things. Um, it's sort of documented. So I think once you get it developed, it's like tinkering, but not like a full uh, blown redo each time. And I think Sarah might be out in radio land somewhere if, if she wanted to weigh in on that, but hopefully that was adequate. Hi, yes, I am here um, and can chime in if that's all right with you, uh, Mr. Chair. Sure, go ahead, Sarah. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I, what all of what uh, Jason said was uh, correct, and I think it depends on uh, different species to a certain extent, but a lot of these components, um, for example, ecosystem importance, there's they're not likely to change. Um, so it would be more a case of the TC taking a quick review of something. And if they happen to know that some new study came out that really changed the scientific world's thinking of uh, a species uh, role in the ecosystem, then for example, that might change um, or on the, um, environmental uncertainty front, if there was a new study that indicated a species was a lot more sensitive to temperature than previously thought, then, then that might change. But some of those um, otherwise can stay pretty static. Um, the socioeconomic components would be updated based on the current data uh, and the uh, stock assessment components would obviously be updated with the current stock assessment information. Um, however, I think once the TC and SES has, has gone through this uh, the first time, it should be relatively straightforward. I think a lot of it is getting used to the process. All right, thanks, Sarah. I got uh, Joe Semino and then Justin Davis and then Pat Keller. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Len, that was, that was a great question. <laughs> um, Thanks, Jay. I, I, I agree I'm worried about like the timing of this, but I, I, I do think cobia is a great candidate species and I'm kind of wondering about its, its partner, you know, since Spanish and cobia are their own board now and Spanish just went through an assessment, you know, looking back at some of the more recent assessments that just happened, if other board members think that Spanish might be a potential candidate. <clears throat> and then, you know, I, I don't know about data poor uh, Jay, but um, I, I agree with you. I, I kind of would be interested to see how this would play into our jointly managed species with the council's risk and uncertainty policy. And lastly, Jay, I just want to thank you for the probability, probability illustration. I think we need that at all our striped bass public hearings to kind of counter the we're just managing on the flip of a coin. So. All right, Justin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This follows a little bit from Lynn's question, but Jay, am I correct that even if we left the weightings in place and didn't touch those, um, that the the probability recommended by this process could ultimately change over time because some of the technical inputs, I think, you know, come from the stock assessment. So as stock as stock status changes, we could end up with a different probability even without changing the weightings. Yeah, thanks, Justin. Uh, no, absolutely, and uh, thanks to Sarah for kind of. Uh, broadening out my I was thinking you know Lynn's question was directed towards what the board might have to do um, the technical inputs would get updated right they would be different uh, for each new process uh, but that again is kind of an uh, would be sort of an automated process they they have these numbers they just kind of plug them in the CES information that's a little different I think there that's a, a bit more work so those technical inputs get up get updated um, so yes those would change. 
All right, Pat Keller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Jay, this is great. Um, as those of you around the table are going to be much uh, more in depth about um, coming on the technical side of this, but from a policy perspective, I'm looking at your last question to the board. Uh, should we require uh, the commission to conduct this process when a relevant action is being expected? But then you talk about the data rich component of this. So I think that speaks to the fact that we probably should look at a data poor species um, to make sure that we have the information that we need or the comparison that we need. So thank you. All right, thanks. So so we've got a request before us. Um, you've got the TOG board has obviously expressed their opinion uh, of applying this, you know, to, to another species and fishery. Uh, so what's the general consensus of our, of our policy board here regarding regarding at least that question? Uh, Lynn? Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I hope I'm going to answer. I, I hope I'm going to address that question. I might not. But I was just going to say that I, I think I like the idea of doing another test case and maybe Cobia, Red Drum. I think either one of those would be great. But I also wanted to flag that I think part of this, too, needs to link to because part of the idea of this was transparency, right? It was codifying to the public how we're arriving at these at this uncertainty level. I also think we need to think a little bit about how we're transmitting this decision tool to the public and whether that goes as a piece on the species website. You know, if you look up TOTOG where it's got all the, you know, stock status, fishery, maybe there's a little section added that says, you know, where what's our risk, you know, tolerance. So that I just wanted to flag that, but I, I think another test case would be good. All right, thanks. So, so sort of what I, I think I'm hearing is another test case in, in a real world situation, and maybe um, you know a, a data poor simulation, you know, would be informative. Uh, sounds like I think, at least from what I'm I'm hearing, uh, John Clark, go ahead. Yeah, just um, just based on Jay's presentation, if we do ask Jay to do those test cases, given the the time frame he was talking about there, that would push finalization of this off for another two three years, correct? So, is it possible to kind of do both to finalize the policy while those would be the first cases that you use, you know, kind of as an actual tool in the management of those species uh yeah well that's i guess that's a question for us really yeah. you know and uh you know it's if if we approve it for you know for use and we don't like what happens with it you know because we don't feel like it was necessarily vetted you know to a satisfactory level to understand it I, you know i'd I don't have strong feelings one way or the other. Go ahead, John. Well, just uh, as Jay showed with Tatag, it, it really didn't make that. It doesn't change things that much, and it does, but it does add uh, more inputs to the model, which I think would help with the public to show that we were considering everything. I uh, personally, I don't have a problem with going ahead and finalizing it, just because. And and I'd like to see those other species done, but you know, as Jay said, that we're pushing the whole decision off then for several more years if we do that. All right, Cherie. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I agree with uh, John. I think we should finalize this as far as it has gone. I presume that it will be going through modifications through its, considering its its infancy at this point in time and in the future it'll go through uh, future modifications as we learn more and I agree I think that uh, a data poor species would be very informative for me to see how this uh, acts and I certainly don't mind having um, one of the southern species uh, cobia or red drum brought forward but I'd like to see how the data poor species reacts thanks all right. Sorry, Erica, for skipping over you. It's okay, Mr. Chair. Um, this is very interesting. I 
I don't know if everyone around the room knows that the South Atlantic Council has been working for the last four years on their ABC control rule, which is said it which is intended to set the management uncertainty. So very similar to this, but this considers different parameters, uh, more parameters than what the council, South Atlantic Council is looking at. So to that first question up there, it makes me wonder, it makes me a little um, hesitant to think that Spanish mackerel might not be the best first test case for this. Spanish mackerel is being reviewed by the SSC today, and we expect there to be um, some revisions to the assessment, hopefully by no fisheries after the SSC has their uh, discussion on it. Um, and reading the last sub bullet there that it's only applicable to data rich quota managed species, I think that red drum then isn't a candidate because the um, management goal for red drum is an SBR target, not a, it doesn't produce a quota for the stock to be managed at. All right, Chris Bass Savage. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I was wondering if Spanish mackerel, how that would work being, you know, a council managed species uh, first and foremost, although the timing for the stock assessment would, would be good. Um, maybe an idea to close the gap between the 2024 assessments and now um, and it might cover the data poor aspect too is uh, we have a black drum stock assessment that should be uh, available by early 2023 um, i'm not sure if if that's a good candidate i mean i think timing wise it might be but assessment wise to the risk and uncertainty tool maybe not so I'm just throwing that out there as a potential uh, idea thanks All right, well, I think, yeah, go ahead, Jay, you want to respond? Yeah, uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. I, I had actually started to think in the same uh, way as uh, Chris, like, so that could be sort of the middle way here is to, you know, we don't have to wait all the way into some point in 2024. We could, um, you know, Black Drum, I hadn't realized was coming up that quickly, but I was even just thinking we could do, take a data poor species and just apply it to that. Um, now there wouldn't again it would we get into the situation like to talk where there wouldn't be like impending management action but maybe with black drum there would be so um, that might be a way to kind of you know keep the momentum going um, and and not have to wait but not get too far out over our skis it sounded like there's some hesitancy amongst the board all right thanks all right Erica so in that case with black drum, we're in the same scenario with red drum. So would you look at your risk and uncertainty for achieving your SPR goal rather than uh, basing on a quota? Because I think about red drum, we actually are aiming to exceed that SPR. And so that's kind of like a minimum threshold. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, same for like uh, same situation that you brought up for red drum. So we'd have, I think it should work. Um, and I, it's just a different, it's, you know, a different metric, but I think, um, I'd have to understand a little bit more about the kind of technical infrastructure there to know if, if it applies directly, but you know, that's, uh, that makes it fun to, <laughs> to look at and, um, try and figure that out. So I, I think we could investigate it at least. All right, thanks. We sort of need to wrap this up. I know it's a, I certainly want to give this short shift because it's extremely important. So may, maybe how about contingent approval of the policy and then do as has been suggested to, to run run black drum through as a as a data pour. See, see how that comes out. Revisit after we get the results of that and see whether or not we need to tweak it. Um, in any ways, that sound like a reasonable sort of middle ground as, as Jay described. Apologies, Mr. Chair, I don't have a way to raise my hand since I am an organizer, but uh, would it be all right if I chimed in here on timing? Sure. Thank you. Um, so I may be, uh, someone correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I was hearing an early 2023 deadline for Black Drum uh, assessment. Uh, I just want to point out that the process, is, especially as we've running this through the first time with uh, boards and TCs um, takes a bit of time to get going. I think we went through 
six or nine months with um, to talk. I don't think in the long run it will it will take that long to do, but especially as as boards are getting comfortable with doing this first time and TCs are getting comfortable with doing this the first time and setting up the uh, decision tools. Um, it takes some time to do. Also, without knowing um, specifically the nature of of the assessment, the tool that's ready to go is specifically designed for the data rich so i would want to confirm that the tool um, wouldn't need to be altered uh, significantly before promising that we can use it uh, on on any data pour not that we can't in the future it just may add additional time if there's adaptation needed beyond something pretty straightforward yeah, I see Jay's head nodding. So I think, yeah, I think our expectations are, are based on on that. We're, we don't we don't have any unrealistic expectations of of a product delivery. So we so everybody's still fairly comfortable with that approach. I see heads nodding. So okay, all right. Well, thank you, thank you, Jay. Thank you as always for your work. And if you want to be called the czar, you can be called the czar of risk and uncertainty. I'm, you know, Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, so, all right, our next agenda item, I want to call on Nicole Costa to give us a NEMAP report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm going to be brief. This is just a sort of update to the board on NEMAP activities and our next steps for the program. Next slide, please. So I'll just give a brief overview of NEMAP cover our mission and goals, talk briefly about the NEMAP name and the efforts of our survey criteria working group. And then I'll get into the bulk of what we want to update you on, which is the NEMAP survey definition and our next steps for the operations committee. We can, next slide, please. We continually like to remind um, the board and others that NEMAP is in fact a program. It's not one specific survey. It's a cooperative state federal program facilitating fishery independent data collection, analysis, and dissemination in the Northeast from Maine to North Carolina. And the current NEMAP surveys include the Southern New England Mid-Atlantic Nearshore Trawl Survey operated by VIMS, the Maine New Hampshire Inshore Trawl Survey, and the Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries Bottom Trawl Survey. Next slide, please. Our NEMAP partners include state marine fisheries agencies from Maine to North Carolina and DC, ASMFC, PRFC, both the Science Center, um, New England Council, Mid-Atlantic Council, and Fish and Wildlife Service. We also have quite a bit of collaboration with the CMAP program on programmatic and process advice and collaboration on technical workshops, including a vessel collaboration workshop and sampling protocols. Next slide, please. This slide is just to acknowledge our NEMAP partners. And again, thank you all and the various committee members from these partners for their continued efforts. Next slide, please. So where a particular fishery usually operates on a small spatial scale, NEMAP covers a much larger geographic range. And this makes the data particularly useful in a variety of ways in stock assessments, including developing indices of abundance used in the models, fecundity estimates, developing length weight relationships, size or age composition outside of the fishery, stock structure in areas where the fishery doesn't operate, and evaluating shifts in stock distribution. Next slide, please. Here are some specific examples of NEMAP data uses. Uh, the full list of species is quite a bit longer, but for the Maine, New Hampshire, it's been used in lobster, shrimp, herring, and groundfish. The Massachusetts survey for black sea bass, scup, cod, lobster, summer and winter flounders, and the southern New England mid-Atlantic for summer and winter flounders, black sea bass, spot, croaker, weak fish, river herring, and lobster. And I know these plots are rather small, but it's not intended for you to actually um, be looking specifically at the plots. This is just an example of how some of the data were used in a coastal ocean and Chesapeake Bay trend comparisons um, using the VIMS data. Next slide, please. So a few years back, the NEMAP mission and goals were revised to shift from design and implementation to enhance coordination and methodology. 
The goals and objectives specifically address collection and analysis of fishery independent data for assessments and management, enhancing coordination among the fishery independent surveys, and promoting use and dissemination of this data, identifying and prioritizing the short and long-term needs of the program, and securing funding for NEMAP activities. Next slide, please. So a little bit about the NEMAP name. Um, as I stated earlier, the current NEMAP surveys include the Maine, New Hampshire, Mass DMF, and the Southern New England, Mid-Atlantic. And these surveys have built a relatively robust reputation for NEMAP. In having the meetings of the Operations Committee, um, it became, became clear that there are a lot of additional fishery independent surveys run by NEMAP partners that also address the NEMAP goals and objectives. Uh, these include surveys run by Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York, Delaware, Maryland, and North Carolina. So we began putting a lot of careful consideration into whether or not we should add these surveys to the NEMAP name. Uh, we previously presented this idea to the policy board and they urged us to use caution in doing so. And so we definitely um, have taken that and have been thinking really considerably about how to do this, if we should do this. Additionally, we've seen increased reference to following NEMAP protocols in wind energy development surveys that are coming online up and down the East Coast. And this kind of caught us off guard because NEMAP doesn't have any official protocols. The surveys under NEMAP individually have protocols and sampling protocols that they follow. Um, so this kind of flagged us that perhaps there is a need to think about and develop some specific NEMAP protocols or survey criteria so we could, one, ensure that any additional surveys added to the NEMAP name were using consistent methodology, and two, safeguard the NEMAP name and make sure that any survey following NEMAP protocols has sources that they could properly cite. And next slide, please. We decided to develop a survey criteria working group as a starting point. The working group was tasked with reviewing NEMAP survey data elements and determining common baseline survey criteria. Uh, this was a large effort by our technical committees and um, Dustin Gregg at VIMS did a tremendous amount of work on this, so I wanted to just give a shout out to him. And it became quite clear after this working group got together that there's still a lot of differences when you get down to the details in all the surveys. And maybe it was um, a little, uh, I'll say maybe we bit off more than we could chew in just trying to dive right into the specific criteria. So we decided to take a step back and maybe come up with a more holistic approach. And so at our annual meeting, we decided to move forward with developing a broad definition of what a NEMAP survey is, and then develop some guiding documents for specific documents, such as gear, sampling methods, biological sample track tracking, and QA, QC protocols. Next slide, please. When developing this definition, we thought it was important to highlight who conducts the surveys, who designs the surveys, and what they're designed for, and the spatial coverage, as well as who reviews the surveys and decides whether they fall under the NEMAP name or not. So this is the definition we came up with. NEMAP surveys are conducted by NEMAP partners. They include both partner and committee-designed surveys and operate on local and regional spatial scales. They're designed to collect long-term fishery independent data on species abundance, distributions, and life history, as well as related ecosystem and environmental information. NEMAP surveys are reviewed and approved by the NEMAP Operations Committee. NEMAP data are collected to support fisheries management, as well as to enhance knowledge of marine fish and invertebrate stocks and the ecosystem. Now, I realize this is a rather long definition. Uh, this was designed specifically with the existing surveys in mind. Give you just a sec to digest that. Next slide, please. So for our next steps, um, now that we have this definition, we would like to establish a high level set of NEMAP principles. So right now we have our operations committee members have each signed up for sort of topics and they're starting to flesh out what these guiding principles for the different topics could be. Again, those could be um, vessel and gear, QA, QC protocols, actual sampling methods, biological sample tracking, 
and we're going to meet and then you know talk about further steps but it could be a very high level set of principles we could get into more detailed criteria but we essentially want to develop some guidance documents for these specific technical topics and then review the other existing fishery independent trawl surveys for possible inclusion under NEMAP. It's not our intent that when a survey becomes an official NEMAP survey, there would be any funding implications or expectations. The purpose and value added is to promote consistent, high quality data collection and dissemination through collaboration among all the surveys. And additionally, develop, the development of these specific protocols will provide the proper resources for other surveys to follow and cite should they choose to do so. Next slide, please. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Questions? Jim Gilmore. Uh, thanks, Nicole. Good presentation. Um, if we standardize this, do you think, or, or has the uh, group thought anything about maybe some conflicts with, well, for instance, New York, we, we do our nearshore trawl survey with uh, State University in New York at Stony Brook. And we've got principal investigators. And now if essentially we're going to go out and we're going to have, well, here's a principal investigator. We want you to do this, but here's your set of rules. And they maybe don't like those rules because they're different professors and they have different approaches to things. So do you think there'll be a uh, any issue with that if we standardize this? That's a very good question. So we've talked a lot about this. Um, we want to develop this definition and these guiding principles not to have anybody change their existing surveys. We want to be inclusive of additional surveys and we want to at the same time make sure that everybody is oper operating consistent methodologies. So we plan on developing these guiding principles first looking at the existing surveys under NEMAP and then as well looking at these additional fishery independent surveys that are already operating. When the survey working group went through the criteria, they primarily were focused on the NEMAP surveys, but we had all of the other state partners fill out the Excel spreadsheets as well. So we are gonna be looking holistically at all the surveys and then, unfortunately, it will take some time. I can't give you a direct answer now how it will shake out, but we do intend on considering that. Follow up, Jim. Yeah, and just on the broader issue, um, I really would like to see it just called NEMAP because it it has such a history. If you go back to when I first started NEMAP, I think when I first started, it was going down. Uh, nobody had money for it. And I know my my state came up with a half million dollars to keep it going. Then I think Massachusetts jumped in there and they were going to try to take a fund or whatever. And then all of a sudden, years down the road, it's like, well, I'm not even sure we're a NEMAP partner anymore. So it just got to be, it, it's a great cooperative effort for everybody. And then saying NEMAP partners, I think we're all partners in this. And I think it's time to maybe just say NEMAP is us, not map is this group of folks whatever so just a suggestion thanks all right jay thanks mr chair uh thanks nicole nice nice presentation is it, and, and i'm kind of like processing what what jim was just saying um so maybe i'll start with you know i was a this is going back a couple of years. I was a proponent just because I thought NEMAP was awesome. And, you know, I was like, oh, if New Hampshire or Maine are in there, you know, Rhode Island should be too. And I, I really liked the idea mainly because I wanted to kind of attach our great survey with another great survey. Um, since then, though, I, I kind of, you know, there's this, and I'm being a little tongue in cheek, but a little, there's magic to NEMAP, right? It, it's this survey and has a lot of industry buy-in, like people, when they you talk about an assessment and, you know, people will scowl at you and then you tell them a NEMAP's in there and all right, and now, this, now it's good. Um, and that's great. I mean, that's what we want. And so I worry about watering that down. Um, and in particular, if the idea that you you and Jim just discussed is that there wouldn't be any sort of omnibus um, you know standardization like I don't I guess I don't kind of see the point then like we can keep NEMAP as NEMAP and the Rhode Island trawl will be the Rhode Island trawl we're all partners just like Jim said and that's fantastic and there's all sorts of now statistical tools to kind of weave these things together thinking of things like vast and 
um, all sorts of hierarchical modeling that we can do to kind of patch the indices together if, if we want to. Um, so I don't see a lot of efficacy in trying to, you know, incorporate all of these other satellite surveys into in calling it NEMAP. So I, I just wanted to offer, it wasn't a question, <laughs> I just wanted to offer that that comment that maybe things are okay. I think we have the tools we need to be able to pull things together when we want, but, but they're different surveys. And so I don't see a lot of need to call them the, the same thing. Oh, and one final comment is, I really like the idea though of developing kind of the NEMAP principles because of now these external entities that are kind of kicking that name around a little bit. So that part I think is good and invaluable. All right. Thank uh, Eric. I assume you're moving that microphone because you want to talk. <laughs> well, you would be correct. So thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with Jay, but, but I am concerned about the, uh, the use of the brand by the wind people, that does concern me. Um, you know, when they say they're following NEMAP protocols, my, my understanding in my little narrow view of the world is they might be towing the same gear. You know, they're towing, towing the Bigelow gear, which is the NEMAP gear essentially. <clears throat> but I, I don't know if, if we should, you know, there is no protocol, so what are they following? They're towing the same gear. And I, I can tell you, there's one, one vessel that's doing a, doing a survey and I can tell you he is very on top of making sure this, the gear is set just right and the spread is just right but I know for a reasonable fact that not everybody does that so that in itself is concerning to me so I, I don't know if, if you know NEMAP should send a letter to Bohm saying <laughs> can't be doing this because they, they shouldn't be doing it. It's not to cite something, the one that doesn't exist and pretend like they're doing a stellar job like NEMAP does, I I, I would disagree with that. So I, I don't know, Mr. Chairman. No, and I think the committee at our annual meeting had similar discussions. We, you know, recognized, um, if you do a, a quick search, you can see there's, a multitude of surveys that are using that language and they're not going into details like you said about what specific protocols they're following and so before we could really question what protocols they were following the committee felt well maybe it is time for us to develop protocols so then we can go to perhaps an individual survey or you know ASMFC could go to them and say you know here are our protocols are you in fact following them and if not, perhaps that language isn't appropriately used. All right, India. Pat Kelleher. Yeah, I just want to um, echo what uh, Jason brought up for points. I'm in complete agreement with those. Um, and I think by, the devel by developing those protocols, it helps to address the issues that Eric's raising. So if they're just doing one portion of the work and it's not all of those protocols that have been, uh, that have been developed, excuse me, developed by NEMAP, then we can have something to stand on if we did have to set the letter. So thank you. All right, sounds like copyright infringement to me. <laughs> Yeah. So, all right. Any other questions uh, or comments for Nicole? Don't see any. So, thank you very much. All right. We're going to move on to some committee reports. And I'm going to call on Bill Hyatt, our legislative committee uh, chair, to give us a report on that committee as well as a request for uh, um, um, approval of a letter of support for house resolution 7801 so bill thank you mr chair so i do have a very brief report um one sort of ask to make to the group and then as you mentioned that that one action item assuming that the support letter is an action item so our committee the legislative committee um has been very active this year we've had eight meetings a uh, big thank you goes out to everybody who's been, all the folks that have been involved, and especially for to Deke for keeping us uh, organized and on task. Um, we have engaged uh, on 
a number of different pieces of legislation engaged with members of Congress. Uh, we've also engaged with members of Congress and agencies relative to uh, appropriations for fiscal year 22 and 23. And uh, we've prepared a number of different background documents uh, and uh, talking point documents for distribution to the commissioners. And that's kind of a very quick and a nutshell summary of, of, of what we've done. Um, one of the pieces of legislation that we've engaged in most deeply uh, is the Recovering America's Wildlife Act. And that brings me to my ask for this group and those of you who are at the, at the luncheon yesterday, this is somewhat of a repeat of that. Um, Basically, that piece of legislation has been six years in the making. I'm going to assume everybody around the table is well-versed in the Recovering America's Wildlife Act and that it is uh, aiming to bring $1.3 billion uh, on an annual basis of permanent funding to state fish and wildlife agencies, which will undoubtedly have some very significant um, impacts to marine programs in, in all of our uh, Atlantic Coast states. Uh, so this piece of legislation is, is has now progressed through, uh, it's been voted out of committees in both the House and the Senate. Um, it has been voted on the, on the House floor. The House has approved it. And it is only awaiting approval um, in the Senate before it will be uh, enacted into law. And uh, and that's there is an if, though, associated with that. It, it It definitely needs to come to a vote in the Senate during the month of September. Um, and as you can imagine, and I'm sure all of your experience uh, tells you at the very end of a, of a session, there's a pretty big log jam in terms of getting things approved and, and up for a vote. So um, my ask to all of you is, is to consider and do what you can to get the word out to your senators. Um, a very simple message ask that you really need to and really support and your constituents really need and support for the Recovering America's Wildlife Act to get on the agenda for a vote. Um, and in addition to uh, you reaching out as you're able, I would ask that you reach out to those organizations amongst your constituents who um, have ha would have similar desire to have this legislation passed. Um, simply because the more people that these Senate offices hear from, the more people that staffers hear from over the over the next month, the greater the likelihood that this bill is going to be um, uh, come to a vote in September. And we're entirely confident that if it does come to a vote, um, that it that it will pass. So that's my ask to each of you. If you take home anything from what I said today, please take that message with you. Um, I think that brings me to the action item, which is a support letter for HR 7801, the Resilient Coasts and Estuaries Act. Um, Estuaries Act? Estuaries Act. Um, this is a piece of legislation that we discussed at the Legislative Committee uh, that we decided to bring, that it was something that we thought the Commission should support. We brought it to the Executive Committee at a, at a previous meeting. Um, discussed it there. Uh, it was, it was, I, I think, say there was consensus that it was something that the executive committee wanted to consider. They asked us to draft a support letter, which we did, and which was brought to the executive committee yesterday. And now, as I understand it, the next step is to get approval from the policy board in order for that to happen. Um, briefly, just to go over a few things in uh, HR 7801, the Resilient Coast and Estuaries Act, uh, bill summary. Uh, it reauthorizes funding for the Coastal and Estuarine Land Conservation Program at $60 million per year for fiscal year 22 through 26. And it authorizes funding for the National uh, Estuarine Research Reserve System at $47 million per year for fiscal years 22 through 26. Um, in addition, it directs the Secretary of Commerce to designate at least five new National Estuarine Research Reserves uh, during that period. Um, background that I'm sure most of you are familiar with, nationwide there are uh, 30 of these, these reserves and uh, 17 of them are located along the uh, states along the Atlantic coast. That's a very brief uh, 10,000 foot summary of the legislation. Uh, uh, with regard to the support letter, it is a letter of support. Our intent is for the commission to send that to the um, the committee chair and the ranking member. 
Uh, and then uh, simply for those of us in the commission to have both the letter and some talking points that Deke has prepared uh, in their back pockets for opportunities to have those conversations. So with that, Mr. Chair, I'm, uh, I assume that that's what you need to get approval here today. Yes, thank you, Bill. Um, as you said, you know, this is a uh, important and very relevant piece of, of legislation. Uh, I know the state of Georgia has benefited from kelp grants in the past, and you know it's been an important source of information for critical habitat acquisitions. And uh, you know this expands it out to allow funding of restoration, which obviously is part and parcel of us dealing with climate change and lots of other things. So the you know the the uh, as Bill said, the executive committee uh, gave it a unanimous support. So what I'm asking for here is there. Is there any opposition to this letter of support uh, from the policy board? I don't see any heads shaking. Uh, so we'll consider that supported by the policy board and we'll get this letter out. And as Bill said, we'll make, make it available to everybody. Uh, and if you have an opportunity uh, to weigh in on it, like I just, as he suggested with the Recovering America's Wildlife Act, I mean, it's a, you know, as he said, that's, that's, that one's gone on a long time and it is literally sitting, the ball that's perched on the, the goal line and, and we don't, uh, it'd be a shame to have a, a goal line defense stop it from getting across, but uh, but it's going to take a lot of effort to get that ball across that line. So anything you can do would be appreciated. So thank you, Bill. Uh, Pat Kelleher. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yesterday at the executive committee meeting, we had a presentation from Rosa that was um, referenced earlier in your report where they were asking for additional funds um, and um, um, in, the, in the, over the last two days, I've been getting information from uh, my governor's office um, on the fact that there's going to be a press conference on another federal bill that is uh, going to be heard that was um, submitted by Representative Whitehouse. It's called the RISE Act. It's a reinvestment act for um, uh, for offshore wind uh, lease revenues, uh, and it'll be a revenue sharing concept that will um, also uh, allow states, uh, territories, tribes to um, uh, apply for grants. It's a fairly significant um, uh, pot of money and considering the conversation yesterday and considering the work that all of us are doing um, from a wind perspective, um, I would request that we spend some time, the legislative committee spend some time on this particular uh, topic as well uh, and bring something back uh, to the board and potentially support uh, this uh, piece of legislation. All right, thanks, Pat, for making us aware of that. And so, Bill, I'll uh, trust that y'all will take that under your umbrella. Oh, absolutely. Um, and that's, that's a piece of legislation vaguely familiar with. Deke sent, put together a synopsis really quick and looked at it, and I think it's something we'd very much like to take up and, and discuss. I think one of the items we would want to discuss probably out of the gate is uh, some of the definitions in the Act about the eligible states and take it from there. But absolutely. Thank you. All right. Thanks again, Bill. All right. I want to call on uh, Dr. Lisa Havel. She is online. She's got a couple of committee reports from the Habitat Committee as well as the Atlantic Coast Fish Habitat Partnership. So, uh, Lisa, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'll wait for... There we go. Okay. Um, I'll start with ACFIP since that's just informational and then move on to Habitat Committee where there's a possible action and I'll try to be as quick as possible. Next slide, please, Maya. The ACFIP Steering Committee met July 20th to 21st, um, where you all are right now in Arlington, Virginia. And um, we mostly focus on our strategic planning. We had discussions on operational funding and grant administration over the next five years and also how the next five years are going to be different than our previous five years, especially in regards to funding opportunities, um, in particular, the infrastructure bill funding that's coming out, um, compared with our strengths, weaknesses, and what makes us new, unique. And all of these discussions are being taken into consideration for our next plan. And we'll release the plan in December of 2022. Next slide. Since I last provided an update, the um, fiscal year 2022 NIPAP projects were approved. And ACFIP was able to fund five on-the-ground projects plus um, operational funding with this funding. 
and $250,000 went for on the ground restoration. And this is the highest amount to date for us. We had projects in Maine, Massachusetts, Connecticut, New Jersey, and Maryland. And combined, these projects will open over 185 river miles, provide access to over, over 9,000 acres of spawning habitat, and restore over 4.5 acres of benthic habitat. Next slide. The first project is Baskahagen Lake and Crooked Brook Flowage. This is led by Atlantic Salmon Federation. It's a pool and weir fishway at Baskahagen Dam in the Penobscot watershed in Maine. The dam is a complete barrier to alewives and other species, and access will um, be restored to 8,960 acres and 137 river miles. And they anticipate that 2 million alewives will benefit from this project. Next slide. And here is the current barrier, the dam. Next slide. Our next project is the Ames Pond Dam Removal and Fishway Construction. This is led by the town of Braintree, and it will remove the Ames Pond Dam and install a pool and weir fishway around Rock Falls on the Monadaquat River in Massachusetts. This will restore access to 180 acres of spawning habitat and 36 river miles, will benefit river herring and American eel. And these two barriers are two of three on the river, and the third barrier was the Armstrong Dam, and we helped to fund that removal last year. Next slide. And here is an aerial view of both of those barriers. Next slide. The third project is dam removal and restoration at Merwin Meadows Park. This project is led by Save the Sound and it um, consists of the removal of the Dana Dam, which is uh, um, also partial channel realignment, on-site sediment use, um, on the Norwalk River in Connecticut, and it will reconnect 6.5 upstream miles, forming 17 miles of free from blowing river to Long Island Sound, will benefit river herring and American shad, and will remove a safety hazard, reconnect 1.13 acres of floodplain, reduce physical and chemical impacts, and educate visitors about the benefits as well. Next slide. Here are two um, images of the Dana Dam ready to be removed. Next slide. This is our fourth and final dam project. Um, this, the Paulina Dam Removal is led by the Nature Conservancy in New Jersey, and they'll remove the Paulina Dam on the Paulins Kill. With, combined with the Columbia and County Line Dam Removals, which we previously funded in, I believe, 2018 and 2021, this will open up a total of 45 river miles of main stem and tributaries to benefit American shad, American eel, and sea lamprey. And um, the project will enhance recreation and public safety, improve water quality, restore hydrology, and improve terrestrial and aquatic connectivity. Next slide. Here is the Paulina Dam that hopefully soon will not exist. And the final um, project that we funded um, was the South River and Herring Bay Oyster Restoration Project, which is led by the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. This project will augment existing hard bottom within two protected oyster sanctuaries along main stem and tidal tributaries of the Chesapeake Bay. It will increase um, the oyster reef in Herring Bay from 0.68 to 2 acres, and it will increase the reef in Glebe Bay from 0.86 to 3 acres. And this work will combat overfishing and sedimentation, and they are working to engage two communities in the restoration plan, oyster gardening, and um, throughout more of the project as well. Next slide. Here is a um, Google Earth image of the two locations for the augmentation. And next slide. As always, ACTIP would like to thank ASNFC for your continued operational support. And then I'll um, jump right into the Habitat Committee report and save questions for the end. So we can do next slide. The Habitat Committee met virtually on May 23rd. Um, we had a discussion about the update on the Acoustics Impact Habitat Management Series, which is moving along slowly but surely. We also had a presentation on the state of Delaware River sturgeon and the Northeast Regional Habitat Assessment. We selected our habitat hotline topic for 2022, which will be promoting resilience in vegetated coastal habitats. And as usual, that will be released in December. And we continued working on state climate change initiatives documents and the fish habitats of concern. Next slide. 
As far as the fish habitats of concern, a brief update. The Habitat Committee has drafted fish habitat of concern designations for all commission only managed species plus Atlantic sturgeon. The thinking with sturgeon was that eventually um, sturgeon hopefully will go back to being managed under the commission um, eventually. Um, and the thinking for only focusing on commission only species were those jointly managed with the councils have EFH and um, habitat area of particular concern designations already. For fish habitat of concern designations, some species have specific designations, whereas other species have less specific designations, and this is due to species characteristics and also data availability. Um, we did not want to just describe all of the habitat, but we used the HATC guidelines in the designation. And a draft fish habitat of concern designation example was provided in supplemental materials, and that was Atlantic Croker. Next slide. When creating the designations, the Habitat Committee considered current commission documents, including FMPs, species habitat fact sheets, habitat management series publications, and more. They considered current literature. They also considered active species habitat matrix. And the draft designations were discussed and agreed upon and then shared with the technical committees for edits. All but two of the species have been completed. And so the plan is to share the full document with um, the policy board within the next few weeks. And then hopefully you'll have time to review it before the annual meeting and um, we can vote on whether or not to approve it in November. Next slide. And the final update is the State Climate Change Initiatives document. This was provided in briefing materials and it's an update to the 2018 publication. It contains information on current climate change initiatives and identifies high level progress along the coast since our 2018 publication. It's meant to be informational and provides a snapshot of initiatives underway in each state. And these initiatives do not necessarily reflect the views of the commission and that is stated in the introduction of the document. Next slide. As we did in our 2016 and 2018 publications, we grouped state initiatives into eight categories. They're listed here for, for time. I won't jump, uh, go into all the details, but they are provided in the briefing materials. And then the next slide. Um, for each of the eight categories, the blue in this graph represents the number of states who initiated that task by 2018. The orange is the number of states that have initiated it by 2022. The gray is the number of states that have not initiated that task. And so you can see that um, most states are active in each of the eight initiatives. Um, and there are only a few initiatives where one or two states have not taken any action on them. And you can see a breakdown of each state's work in the table provided in the briefing materials. And that will that table will be included as an appendix in the final document. Next slide. So for today, I'm hoping to have this climate change document approved, and then if it is approved, the next step next steps would be formatting and then sharing it, um, releasing it widely. Um, and with that, I'm happy to take any questions on either ACFIP or Habitat Committee, and um, open I'm open to a motion to approve the climate change document as well. Thank you. All right, thank you, Lisa. Any questions for, for Lisa about her presentation? Don't see any. Um, we do need <clears throat> policy board approval of the uh, update, uh, as she referenced in there. I don't know that we need to do a formal motion. Is there any opposition to um, approving the update document as was in your briefing materials? Don't see anybody shaking their head. So, all right, we'll consider that approved by unanimous consent. So, all right, well, thank you very much, Lisa. Thank you. All right, next, I'm gonna call on uh, Patrick Campfield for update on the stock assessment <clears throat> committee. And then look after him, we'll have doctors Drew and Anstead give us an update on the progress of river herring and American eel stock assessments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Assessment Science Committee met in May. Um, their three main topics were to receive a, 
uh, final presentation on the red drum simulation assessment. That was a big project that finished uh, earlier this year successfully. Uh, the committee also discussed assessment training workshops that we'll, we will be planning for this winter and into 2023. And also uh, the usual business of reviewing the commission's stock assessment schedule. Next slide, please. Uh, the, the schedule is in your policy board uh, supplemental materials on pages 36 and 37. If this is a little tough to read, um, next slide, please, Maya. But the uh, major proposed changes for the short term in 2023 and 2024 are that the Black Sea Bass uh, Research Track Assessment shifted from this fall into spring of 23. And that'll be followed by a management track assessment in June that will, if everything's successful, provide uh, management advice and reports to be received in next July. Um, also in 2024, an assessment update was recommended by the Assessment Science Committee uh, for to talk. Next slide, please. And I won't read through them, but these are all the proposed changes for the longer term uh, in 2025 and 2026. Um, notably, uh, there's a request last time the committee provided an update to the board for a COBIA stock assessment. And so that has been added as a benchmark through CDAR in 2025. Um, but that is the full list of stock assessments that have been added either through CDAR or NRCC, the Northeast process, um, or otherwise recommended by the Assessment Science Committee. Um, if we could just go to the final slide, please. Um, just two take home messages. Uh, the assessment activity continues to be very busy. Uh, 2022 was, a, I think, our busiest year in, in the past decade. Um, and there are several species uh, on the horizon. I think the action for today, Mr. Chairman, is to uh, see if you all have any requests or modifications to the uh, stock assessment schedule, and if not, to seek your approval of the Assessment Science Committee's recommendations. Thank you. All right, any any questions, concerns about the proposed stock assessment schedule? Don't see any. Uh, Chris Bat-Savage? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Not a concern, but uh, certainly support um, considering the addition of weak fish to the 2025 for 2025 for an assessment update. I think the terminal year for the last assessment was 2017, so it's probably good to just get a check on where we are now compared to then. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Chris. Any anyone else? Um, any opposition to accepting the proposed stock assessment schedule as presented by Pat? All right, don't see any. So, Pat, consider it approved as presented. Thank you. All right, so I'll go to Drs. Drew and Anstead for their update. So, the river herring stock assessment is proceeding apace. We just had our data workshop uh, in mid July, so where the TC got together to review the available data sets. Um, and decide on things like the terminal year as well as a set of, term, of uh, terms of reference. So because there was no um, River Herring Board meeting this meeting, the terms of reference and the stock assessment subcommittee will be approved via email. So if you are on that board, keep an eye out. Um, and we're still on track to complete this and present it at the um, annual meeting in 2023. So happy to take any questions about that. Any questions for Dr. Drew on that? All right, don't see any, all right. All right, the uh, EEL stock assessment team has finished the benchmark stock assessment and it is now in the hands of the TC. We will be presenting the stock assessment to the technical committee next week for their comments, edits, and hopeful approval to go to peer review, which we hope will happen this fall. And then we would bring the assessment to you all in um, or the eel board rather in um, the annual meeting. Uh, we have developed a delay difference model as recommended by the previous peer review as well as 
addressed some of the other work that the peer reviews um, discussed in their last report. We've tried a bunch of methods and uh, also evaluated the young of the year data to make some recommendations about where states might be able to cut back. So to um, take away some of the burden of those surveys while still maintaining the time series. We also have evaluated some index-based methods for setting catch advice, because I know that's been a concern for the board for a while. How do we set a coastwide cap for eel? So we used a Northeast Fishery Science Center paper and developed um, one of the methods that they recommended to set catch advice. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions about uh, the process of the eel assessment. All right, thanks. Any questions for Kristen? Uh, John Clark? Yeah, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, will the new model be similar to the last one, uh, given I don't think the data has really improved that much, that it'll just give us a either depleted or not depleted type of designation? Uh, <laughs> you are correct that we had the similar challenges with the delayed difference model that we had with the DBSRA. We have developed it. We did develop reference points for it, but the way it stands now is we're suggesting the index-based methods for setting catch advice rather than the delayed difference model as it is in its current iteration, but we'll see how that goes through with the TC, the peer review. Maybe there'll be some suggestions coming out of that. It's fully developed, so it's available for their consideration. But I think um, probably we will fall back on the index methods. All right. Any other questions? All right. See you then. Thank you both for your reports. Appreciate it. All right. Now I'm going to go back to Tony. Yesterday we had a <clears throat> presentation about the Atlantic Sturgeon Bycatch Working Group Draft Action Plan. And we're asked if we had any comments on behalf of the Commission, so I want to turn to Tony for an update on that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I did receive a request for us to provide comments on the draft action plan. Um, uh, this individual wanted to emphasize um, the improved coordination with the TRT, the right whale TRT, and their activities ongoing with making changes to the gillnet fishery and to make sure that the actions that are occurring through the sturgeon bycatch plan is coordinated with the TRT's action to make sure that we're not um, taking uh, double action on the gillnet fishery. In addition, they wanted the letter to convey the commission and state's interest in planning and conducting the science proposed in the draft action plan. Um, you know, the commission is the one that uh, completes the stock assessment for sturgeon, so it's feels that it's in our best interest and the state's best interest to work towards the research questions. So um, having us do that research is important. Um, and I think that was the general gist of it. Um, Jason, I don't know if you had anything in addition to add to Connor's request or not. And if anybody else had any additional um, requests for a comment on this, I'm happy to take them. All right, Pat Kelleher. Um, I, I certainly don't have any objections to the the TRT component um, of the request. I, I'm concerned about the research piece because I don't know what that means for the states. Um, so without having a better understanding of what that's going to mean from a state perspective, I'm a little leery about uh, agreeing to having that language in there. And, and what's the timing on this comment letter? I guess other question. So they are, you know, um, I'm going to have to talk with um, Spencer to see if we have time for an actual letter, if I just need to talk to him about where the commission's concerns are. Obviously, he heard the concern yesterday about the overlap of the TRT, um, so he is aware, aware of that. They are going to be posting the um, draft action plan in early September, um, to my understanding. So there's not a ton of time to, to return. I don't think this is an a official comment period type of situation where we have a date that we have to give them comments by. So I'll have to check with him on that. Uh, and I 
I don't know what Connor's intention was on the the state's responsibility for the science, so I can't answer that that question. Um, but suffice it to say that there's certainly we need to make sure that whatever we're putting in that letter is within everybody's comfort zone. So. Uh, Okay, letter. if you want to call on him, yep. And Spencer, I've unmuted you. Hi, thanks, folks. Um, I just joined, so um, I heard the comment about timing. So Tony was pretty much right. We plan on getting the um, final action plan released um, and online at least ahead of the um, New England Council meetings. Um, in September, and so, you know, we need to wrap up anything that we need to do to change, make changes to the plan, um, at least by the last couple of weeks of August, um, in order to get things through review and to make sure that whatever we've, whatever changes we've made um, to the action plan are um, acceptable and make sense and um, things like that. So. The assessment that there's not a ton of time is probably accurate. Um, just the unfortunate way the timing of this meeting came out with uh, our our schedule and, and the New England Council meetings um, in September. So, all right, thanks, Spencer. Sounds like we can at least draft up something with the concern we know about, and maybe you can circle back with with Connor and and maybe or if, if Jay can inform that. Yeah, maybe not. But I, so I just um, I pulled up the email and, and kind of reread. I, I think his intent was just, um, you know, so I, I thinking about it now, you know, the concern of are you asking us to do anything? I, I don't think that was necessarily the intent, but just to involve the states directly, since the commission is the one that does the assessment and they're talking about areas in our state waters or in proximity to them um, that we should be informed. And I think that's all he meant, not sort of um, obligating us to any sort of work. Um, so hopefully that helps. Does that increase your comfort level a little bit more there, Mr. Keller? Yeah, I don't have to take any extra blood pressure medicine, Mr. Chip. I'll be good. Well, your, your, your health, mental and physical is always in the forefront, you know? as it was when I was vice chair. <laughs> so, all right, well, it sounds like we at least have something that we can build on that we're comfortable with. And right. and I'll touch base with Spencer offline to see if the timeline that I think it would take us to get a letter together does not work with what he needs and if he and I just need to talk through what our major concerns are for them to address prior to them needing to posting um, for the council meeting. All right. All right. Thanks, Tony. All right. Uh, our next agenda item is a review of blue catfish science in Chesapeake Bay. Uh, I know we have, I think this is a two person presentation. I think one of the, the, the third person is not going to be available. But uh, so, who was that? All right. So we have Mandy Bromelo and Christine Densmore. So I'll turn it over to you. Thanks. Can you all hear me? Okay. Yeah, go right here. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so first, I just want to thank you all for um, inviting us to speak today. Um, so my name is Mandy Bromelow, and I'm a fishery specialist at the NOAA Chesapeake Bay office, and I also coordinate the Invasive Catfish Work Group. Um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about who's in the work group and how we're trying to combat the issue of invasive catfishes. And I should note that the work group is not solely focused on blue catfish, as many people talk about, um, but we are also concerned with flatheads. Um, again, the majority of the attention and work is placed on blue catfish at the moment, um, but flatheads are more of an issue in our upper tribs and uh, up in Pennsylvania. Next. So the Invasive Catfish Work Group is a large multi-stakeholder work group within the Chesapeake Bay program. Um, we have members ranging from North Carolina to Pennsylvania, and they include not only managers, but folks from other state and federal agencies, nonprofits, 
academic institutions, um, as well as industry, including both commercial and recreational fishers and processors. <clears throat> and this stakeholder diversity um, is very intentional when we were putting together the work group. Um, we wanted to make sure that the interests and perspectives of everyone involved in the issue were represented within the group um, sort of in the hopes that we would come up with some collaborative solutions that would meet the needs of many stakeholders. So the work group first met at a workshop in January of 2020 um, to discuss the issues and talk about some strategies for dealing with them. And those discussions at the workshop resulted in a Chesapeake Bay program management strategy for invasive catfishes. Um, at the workshop, the invasive catfish work group identified two primary objectives. Uh, first, to reduce the abundance of invasive catfish in the Bay and second, to mitigate their spread and ecological impacts within the ecosystem. Um, the management strategy lays out four approaches for addressing these objectives. Next. Um, the first approach is to increase public awareness, not just that these fish are invasive and have negative impacts, which is obviously an important aspect of this issue, but we're also, um, letting people know that blue catfish are a tasty white fish that are great to eat. Um, so we wanna get more people interested in eating blue catfish in order to improve the market and hopefully the fishery. Next. <clears throat> the second approach is to remove processing barriers. Currently the USDA requires inspections during processing operations. Um, and this increases costs and puts extra burden on the processors. So. We want to remove these barriers, uh, particularly for those wild caught catfish in the bay, um, and try to get more people into the fishery. Next. The next approach is to continue conducting and synthesizing research. So there's been a lot of great work that's been done on invasive catfishes in the bay, um, but we still have a lot of data gaps when it comes to their biology and ecology, and particularly their population dynamics in the bay. Um, so we have some other really important questions that we need to address in order to effectively manage them. Next. And finally, we recognized at the workshop that each tributary is very different. Um, each tributary is at a different stage of invasion, um, and there may even be different fishing interests across the tributaries. So our final approach is to develop um, what we call tributary-specific management plans. Next. Um, so to organize the invasive catfish work group for action, we developed three subcommittees to focus our efforts. Next. The Outreach and Marketing Committee uh, has been working with partners to develop fact sheets and public perception surveys. Um, they're attending public outreach events like seafood festivals and expos. Um, and they're generally trying to get the word out about those negative impacts of invasive catfish um, and get more people interested in eating them. Next. <clears throat> the Science and Research Synthesis Committee uh, has been compiling a lot of the information from previous studies and identifying available sources to better understand what we already know and what resources we have for future studies. And they're using that information to identify and address knowledge gaps. Um, so some of the work that our members have done include diet studies to quantify impacts on species, um, and salinity tolerance studies to assess their potential to spread. Next. The tributary specific management committee is focused on cross jurisdictional coordination efforts um, to develop catfish fishery management plans, um, or at least incorporate some language um, of invasive catfish in their existing fishery management plans. Um, they are working to make sure that management is a bay-wide or even a watershed-wide effort. Um, and they're also helping to develop an invasive catfish data hub um, and map where we can keep up to date on all of our information. So they're mapping areas where um, blue and flathead catfish have been found in the bay and sort of harvest numbers um, in the different tributaries and things like that. Next. Um, so that's a, a super brief overview of the invasive catfish work group. Um, but as I'm sure you know, there's a lot more to this issue. Um, there's a lot of different sides to it. Um, so if you want to learn more about the work group and what we're doing, um, you can email me. My email is up on the screen um, at mandy.bromelo at noah.gov. Um, 
or you can visit the Invasive Catfish Workgroup webpage on the Chesapeake Bay Program website. Um, the website also has the management strategy and a lot of the minutes from previous meetings um, if you're interested in those details as well. Um, but that's all I have for the overview. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Christine to talk a little more about the research that um, Workgroup has been doing. Okay, thank you, Mandy, um, and thank you, everyone. I'm Dr. Christine Densmore. I'm a veterinary medical officer with the Eastern Ecological Science Center with USGS. So uh, just to kind of follow what Mandy was telling you, the broader scheme of things with the invasive catfish work group, I wanted to give you kind of a, a more close up of a small piece of the work that's going on. Some of the newer work we're doing for research and support of the management of blue catfish across the area. Um, Again, I am with USGS, but this is a multi-agency effort that we're doing. A lot of this in, in, you know, in, in some of the southern tributaries and now moving into some of the northern ones. So the catfish, the blue catfish have moved north. The research has gone along with it also. So um, first, uh, I guess the, the triple arm of things that we're doing within USGS right now with the Eastern Ecological Science Center, first of all, we're looking at diet of blue catfish around the area. And this work that our involvement in USGS is largely just in support of our partner agencies and organizations that are doing diet-based studies. Um, the main one I'll be discussing today is Salisbury University in Salisbury, Maryland on Delmarva. Uh, they're working on looking at blue catfish diet in the Nanakoke River. Um, Mary Groves, who couldn't be here today with Maryland DNR, has done that as part of their scope of work looking at blue catfish influences on the Patuxent River in Maryland. Um, so with the, the diet portion of this study, along with Salisbury, we're also working with Maryland DNR folks, Brett Coakley, on that part of the study on the Nanakoke River, as well as Johnny Moore and his team in Delaware Denrack. Um, and uh, elsewhere, I'll be talking about things we're working with Virginia Commonwealth University on uh, some of the health perspective things we're doing. And UMCES Appalachian Lab is involved in some of the molecular analyses for diet that we're doing also. So again, diet's the first arm of this. Health and disease, looking at other potential impacts through, um, you know, not with just kind of cohort, just other, other fish in the area, uh, what could they be passing back and forth? What type of um, health ramifications are there, not only among blue catfish populations, other catfish populations, and you know other fisheries resources? And we're also looking at uh, reproduction and uh, spawning behavior. And again, as Mandy mentioned, you know we're looking at a kind of a tributary specific basis as we're doing this research because tributaries vary so much throughout the Chesapeake. Now we're moving this uh, the work that has been done a lot in some of the, the further southern tributaries in Virginia areas and moving this a little north into the Nanakoke. So next slide, please. Okay, here's a nice gross slide for you all just before lunchtime. Um, in talking about what, what we're seeing on the Nanakoke River, this is just kind of a sampling of some of the, the preliminary results we've gotten so far. Again, the Nanakoke work is, um, largely being done as a, a study through Salisbury University with support of USGS, uh, Maryland DNR, and Delaware DENRAC. Um, dietary impacts of blue catfish on other resources are pretty high on the list of concerns of management agencies for good reason. They are non-selective feeders, omnivorous, um, transitioning to a more piscivorous diet as they grow larger. There's a lot of this work that has been done assessing diet and potential impacts on fisheries resources in the Virginia tributaries further to the south. Again, as the fish are moving north, we're transitioning some of this to the north. Mary has done a lot of this on the Patuxent River, and now we're looking at the Nanakoke. So here's just, again, a sampling. This is preliminary because the uh, the work that Salisbury is doing is going through the end of 2022. So we only really have the, the first half of this study in right now. But you can see there are a variety of types of critters there. Again, non-selective feeders. We're finding a lot of detritus and plant matter in stomachs. We're finding um, some things we really can't identify as yet. Hopefully the molecular analysis we're doing to kind of um, buffer this study will help that also but we are finding um, uh, the corbicula clams. So they're, they're going after Asian clams also to a good degree. Blue crabs are in there a little bit. That one in the upper left is a hog choker. And then a few of the other species, again, you know, unidentified right now. Um, 
data collection is is ongoing and will be through the end of this year. This slide pretty much exemplifies that what we're seeing so far is consistent with what has been reported in other tributaries, that these these critters are fairly non-selective and they'll go after what's there. I'll also note in the middle in the top there that you may not be able to see that too well from the back, but those are actually corn kernels in the gut of that specimen there. We think uh, that fell off probably a barge in the Nanticoke River. So again, very opportunistic in their feeding behavior throughout. So next slide, please. Okay, and here again is some of Zach Crum, the graduate student's preliminary data. He has this laid out here as percent weight. Of course, he's also looking at it by um, frequency of occurrence and, and a few other metrics also. And this is based on just the, the 218 positive stomach samples we have so far through May. Um, also note on this, again, it, it is preliminary where we will have some molecular data to back this up for some of the unidentified species later on. They're also going to be doing some stable isotope work to further assess trophic relationships in blue catfish from the Nanticoke River, comparing with other species. Um, based on what we're seeing so far, again, we're, we're seeing a lot of consistency with what's been reported for the more southern tributaries. We're seeing a lot of detritus and plant matter in, in the gut. We're seeing um, white perch as far as a, a large makeup of both percent weight and uh, frequency of occurrence. We're seeing a lot of gizzard shad. There's a, this, to a lesser degree, there's some unidentified allocene species and some that they have identified. I think there was a blueback herring um, in there and um, maybe an, I think an alewife from some of the, the reports that Zach has, has given with us so far and the occasional blue crab even in the nanico. Okay, next slide, please. So that to be continued once um, this work should be wrapping up toward the end of calendar year 2022 and hopefully um, coming to fruition in, in about a year from now. Um, one other thing I thought you might find interesting just related to diet is um, one of their more interesting findings from this past year was the remains of an adult wood duck in the stomach of one of the larger catfish specimens. You can see there on the, the uh, left-hand side of the slide, a lot of the feathers and um, the actual bill of the duck that, that came out of that. So yeah, <laughs> they'll eat what's there. <laughs> okay, next slide, please. Okay, just a quick overview of some of the other things with um, my laboratory and, and my background as a veterinarian, of course, we're interested in, in health of critters across tributaries and invasive species uh, of concern because of what they may be bringing with them, what may be disseminated along with them to other native species or other important resources. So uh, what we are doing is working across three different tributaries. We're working with VCU in the James River. Uh, we're working with Mary Groves and her crew in the Patuxent, and then with these folks in the Nanticoke right now, just to get some idea of what would be considered normal health status, both grossly and histologically. So on a microscopic scale, what are we seeing as far as the health of the tissues? What type of parasites might be there as a normal abnormality? As you see that um, on the lower left there, that's a mixosporian from the gill of blue catfish we're finding throughout all three tributaries we're examining. So you know, we're looking a little further into that to try to speciate it and perhaps even see where it is in some other catfish in the region. What might be the implications of something like that? Above that is an unusual case that we saw last fall. Actually, the, the Salisbury University folks picked this up working where we're seeing these kind of cystic blister-like lesions on the exterior of the catfish. They kind of came and went in late fall, haven't seen them since, wondering if we'll see them again later this year. We have no um, uh, actual um, etiology identified for them right now, but we are still looking and prepared to, to look a little harder once if, if they do recur again in the fall. So yeah, we're gonna look and see what's normal across the tributaries and what implications there might be, again, for not only the blue catfish population, but for health and disease of other species, as well as any potential human health implications there might be there. We're gonna do a little bit of microbiology along this with it, just to see what type of um, pathogens they might carry, and if any would have any human health significance for a fish in a developing fishery in the region. So next slide, please. Okay, and this one, sorry, the text isn't coming through on there very well, but this is just another example of something that's a, 
an unusual health presentation that we saw just from folks that had been out fishing with this type of hemorrhagic lesion around the face and the mouth. Uh, this was off Barron Creek in the Nanticoke River. We are working to identify this right now, or actually to confirm the identity. We think we've identified a bacterial pathogen. It's a little unique to find in catfish. So again, we're kind of interested in the implications of this for not only catfish health, but for other other types of aquatic animals in the region. So again, that type of thing that we're, we're considering as we're looking into health within the species in the area. So next slide, please. And the final arm of this is uh, the reproductive biology that we're looking at a little more um, in the Nanacoke River right now. Again, there's been some work done on reproductive biology by the folks at VIMS further south in some of the um, Virginia tributaries. But we're taking another look at it in the Nanacoke just to compare uh, reproductive staging and gonadal histology, so looking at it on a microscopic level. Um, and at the same time, doing some blood plasma sampling, looking for estradiol and calcium levels in the females as indicators of spawning and of basically the, the annual cycle of reproductive hormonal change and seeing how that correlates with what we're seeing in the actual gonadal development. Uh, so, yeah, we're looking at it through seasons as we're collecting for uh, the, the diet analysis. We're also collecting for blood sampling and um, gonadal sampling. And... Um, that that's in process right now. So what we have here is some preliminary data showing, you know, what we've seen in some other tributaries where we're seeing um, basically a tend towards spawning peaking in the May to July area. And uh, we had that the highest levels that we saw last time in June. So we'll see how that continues as this unravels as the year goes on and we collect the rest of the data looking at how um, this compares from the Nanacoke to some of the other tributaries, what consistency and inconsistencies there may be. So next slide, please. I think that's it. Again, that was just a whirlwind tour of some of the, the newer research that's going on in the blue catfish community. As you all are probably aware, there is quite a large body of research that's been um, more concentrated again in the southern part of the bay and the Virginia tributaries. And as the fish have moved and as in keeping with the, the aims of the invasive catfish work group for looking at tributaries specifically for management, we're, we're aiming to do the same thing and look at these other tributaries a little further north. So now Mandy and I are happy for any questions or discussion points you all may have. Th thank you all very much for that, that presentation. It's, uh, it's an annoying and also interesting predicament, you know, <laughs> when you have to deal with, with things like that. So I got uh, John Clark and uh, Bill and then Jay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the presentation, Christine. And, um, the nanocoke there, I know just from some of the trawl sampling we've done, the biomass of blue catfish now is absolutely staggering. I just can't believe how quickly they've reached this this huge amount of biomass. I was just wondering, A, are you seeing cannibalism among them? Because some of the trawl we, we bring up, there's nothing else there except for blue catfish from this size up to, you know, the 10-pound the size. And we've had several new state records for catfish set just in the past couple of years with blue catfish. And then second, I noticed you did have shad as one of the dietary items. And we do have a shad hatchery on the Nanacoke. And I'm just wondering if we're spending all this money just to feed blue catfish. <laughs> Hopefully not. Um, to answer your first question, yes, we are seeing some evidence of uh, cannibalism there. They have, um, in, on the Nanacoke, they have reported blue catfish in the stomach so far. Um, secondly, yes, and actually I've, I've been at that hatchery for, for working there on site with Johnny, so that's a, a great place, yeah. So, it's, yeah, it's kind of was central for where we were working up the fish. Um, I hope not. I, I hope what they have found in some, some of the work that's been done, I think by uh, Joe Schmidt and the folks out of Virginia Tech and the southern part is while some of the, the Ilhocenes have been found as contents, they haven't represented a, a huge, huge amount of that. Um, uh, but they, they made the cautionary note in that too. Of course, it's gonna be very density dependent. It's gonna just depend on you know <laughs> how things goes. So they're not one of the, um, I guess the top uh, things that we've found so far. Again, on the Nanocoke, that's all preliminary. We'll have to wait and see how this all washes out later on. But they're there, but they're not there in as huge a quantity. Gizzard shad, much more so than the other low scenes, I think, so far. All right, Bill Hyatt. 
Yeah, just a couple of quick questions. The first one that comes to mind, is, what is known, understood, or maybe speculated about the, um, the cumulative impact of the different uh, invasive species in addition to the blue cats and the flathead cats in the area? And I'm asking that because oftentimes you look at, like, for example, the diet of a single, single invasive species, and, and you don't see the full picture. You don't see the full picture because you're not seeing the other invasive species layered on top of it. And sometimes you're not seeing the dietary shifts that are forced on to native predators in order to develop a real understanding of a cumulative impact that it might have. So that's that's the, the first question. Is there anything, and I guess speculative is probably where you might have to go with that. And then the, the second one is I thought I saw in the report some mention of there being a a uh, canal or watered connection between Chesapeake and parts of the Delaware Delaware Bay system. And I'm wondering what preventative methods are in place or, or contemplated to... Well, <laughs> okay. There's a straight connection to Chesapeake and Delaware Canal. Yep. Okay, so only one question. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> uh, I wish I had an answer for you. Um, I, I actually don't. I think that's an excellent question as far as the cumulative impacts and um, certainly something we could be, be looking at a little harder. Something else to consider with, with blue catfish, the, the more we tend to get into the dietary analysis is um, they don't seem to be quite the apex predator we had once feared. And that's not to say they're not gonna have impacts. They're not going to have, you know, certainly in the density and the numbers they have, it, you know, you can anticipate that that's a good possibility. But they're um, more of, I guess, a, a, a meso predator uh, as far as, uh, again, this uh, paper by, by Joe Schmidt and his colleagues out of Virginia Tech had examined this in some of the Virginia tributaries and found just the, the amount of plant matter, the amount of detritus, the amount of, you know, invertebrates and, and other things there. And some of the, I guess, um, fish species that aren't as much of interest from a, a managed resource perspective, tended to be a little bit, bit higher in the diet than other items. Um, yeah, when you, when you look at them, when you look at them, you know, kind of in conjunction with, you know, the, the flathead catfish, the northern snakehead, some of the other priority invasive fish species in, in Chesapeake, that's a great question as far as what overall might they be doing kind of cumulatively, uh, you know, for individual species? I think this, and again, it just may depend a little bit too on where your your um your focal point is, because and that that's the whole reason for the, the tributary specific management that we're looking to in the invasive catfish work group is it is going to vary trib by trib. So, but yeah. All right, Jay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, actually, I'll start with, and, and I um, just to be clear, I mean this as a biologist, as a compliment. You, you win the award for most gross pictures in a presentation. Uh, well, well done. Um, I had a question about some of the diet uh, work that um, you guys are doing, and so you mentioned uh, some molecular techniques, and so I'm assuming the molecular techniques can ID species. But can you also tell um, the contribution to that gut, you know, like the proportion that that unidentified species um, is in the in the gut? It's um, this comes up. This idea comes up a lot in the context of uh, ecosystem management because we work with a lot of diet information. And that's kind of a um, something I've been wondering about if the molecular techniques are that good yet. Okay. First of all, thank you. As a veterinary pathologist, uh, yeah, I, gross picture is a plus, so I, I take that as a compliment. Thanks. <laughs> um, secondly, yes, for the uh, molecular analysis, we are looking at some um, gene sequence analysis. We're working with, again, the folks out of UMCES to help us with this long pipeline of processing and then turning this around with bioinformatics to take these gene sequences and tell us what species that we cannot identify because it is so gross um, that they may be having in the stomach. Um, for that, as far as looking at proportions, I think, and again, this is, I have to, I have to apologize because it's not my specialty as far as the, the diet analysis thing. I think them looking at it through both, you know, percent weight and frequency of occurrence helps get to some of that information as far as how much is there 
um, individually. When we're looking at the molecular, we're, for, for this purposes of this study, we're looking at uh, samples from individual specimens that we just can't identify grossly. So we hope to just get you know one answer back that this is a sequence from you know a blueback herring or what what have you as far as that. Um, again, something else they are doing to get to more of a broader trophic interaction answer for the Nanocoke River is that the Salisbury University folks are going to be doing some stable isotope work along with that also. So they're collecting some tissue samples from the blue catfish specimens as well as some from some of the uh, other native and some other non-native species that we're encountering in the area too to do some stable isotope comparisons. So. All right, Eric. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the presentation. I just have a quick question about one of your bullet points. Uh, what are the barriers, the processing barriers? Is it regulatory or is it the fish itself? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Um, yeah, so the barrier is um, really just that um, inspection requirement that I had mentioned. Um, essentially, they need to have an inspector in the um, processing area. So it's a matter of having to pay folks to work overtime to stay there for when they're doing the processing. And then um, they also have to, um, it's overtime and then the, um, what am I trying to say? The, it's, it's a cost, it increases the cost and the burden on the processors. And it actually was such an issue that there were um, even more like smaller processing operations in the Bay that um, stopped processing catfish because of that inspection requirement. It was just too much. It wasn't worth um, having to go through that inspection requirement and the cost and all that to continue to process catfish. Um, so now we're down to like a few major operations that are doing it. Um, and so it's also, I know it's also been sort of a burden for um, some of the fishers as well, because um, they had to work uh, or collect fish and like turn them in at a certain time. Um, but if it wasn't when the processor was there, it sort of messed up the whole operation. Um, so it, it's really just that that inspection requirement for catfish um, that we're trying to trying to work through somehow. Um, but again, it's it's more of a political thing. So um, we haven't really been able to do anything specifically as a work group to to get through that. Um, but we we do have folks like we have processors and other folks um, on the work group that are trying to provide information for folks who can lobby for that change. All right, Eric. Yeah, I'll, I'll be brief, Mr. Chairman. I, yeah, I'd like to talk to you about that a little bit because it doesn't make any sense to me. But so I'll, I'll give you a, a call offline to save everybody. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right. I think uh, Lynn or John to that point. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to clarify a little bit um, with what from what Mandy said and Marty can help that this is a federal requirement. It's part of it's it, it's it's incorporated into the farm bill. It's it's a it was a as I understand it was a put in place. It was aimed at catfish processors in the South, but it, this is an unintended consequence of a federal piece of legislation um, that we're trying to work through. So this is a USDA thing. Yes. Oh God help you. That's all I gotta say. <laughs> I was going to mention, um, there actually, um, Maryland Congressman Harris um, put in some new language in the, some catfish language in the appropriations bill for the House. Um, and that would essentially transfer that inspection requirement to the FDA. Um, and it would, it would basically give the processors a waiver for uh, wild cat, wild caught blue catfish in the Bay. So that was a potential um solution at least um to start with uh helping remove that processing barrier in the bay i'm not sure where that has ended up though at this point no, i'm gonna go to lauren and then to pat gear okay uh thank you mr chair uh thank you for that fascinating report regarding uh rivers that i personally have uh, enjoyed including uh the tidal area of the patuxent river uh about 40 years ago i remember doing recreational fishing for channel catfish there and really enjoyed it. Do the blue catfish displace 
the channel catfish when they arrive. Yeah, I'm not sure about that, but I'm seeing some nods from around the room. So <laughs> the, the answer Pardon? is yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was going to mention that um, they have seen sort of uh, competition with white catfish. So as blue catfish have increased in their abundance, um, white catfish have decreased. But I haven't actually heard about um, channel catfish impacts, but it sounds like other folks are aware of that. All right, Pat, here. Yeah, you know, I'll try to wrap this up because we could talk about this all day I know. between the yep. three of us. Um, you know, in Virginia, we have a unique problem that our freshwater fisheries agency has developed a world-class trophy fishery for this. So it's multi-million dollars. People come to the James and catching 90 to 100 pound fish. However, the biomass of the sub-adults is so large that it's starting to stunt the growth of these. It's affecting this trophy fishery. So they've asked us to, they've asked, they've come to VMRC and asked us, how can you increase your commercial harvest? So we've come up with some ideas. We're trying to work with them on that. Getting back to Bill's concern about um, uh, predation on other species, Mary Fabrizio just finished this study for us that found that in a small area on the James, about 200 square miles, uh, 200 uh, square nautical, no, kilometers, I'm sorry. Um, the blue cats were eating 2.3 million crabs. And um, if anyone knows, you know, in Chesapeake Bay, we're having problems with blue crabs right now. So um, there are impacts. There are also impacts probably potentially to striped bass because these are these fish are in the nursery grounds as well. So um, as you said, they eat about they eat anything. They'll eat they'll eat anything that they can get a hold of. But, you know, further down, a lot of the studies have been done further in fresher water, but Mary's study was in the museo, museo area, which was between, I think, um, six and 15 parts per thousand. So, so it is a problem. We could talk all day about this if you want. All right. Thanks, Pat. And, and thank you, Mandy. And thank you, Christine. It's, a, it's a, like I said, it's an intriguing and vexing issue, and uh, we appreciate the presentations. So. All right, at this point, I'm going to go to Sharon Benjamin for a review of NOAA Fisheries Draft Equity and Environmental Justice Strategy. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, we got you loud and clear. Wonderful, thank you. Sorry, I don't have such fabulous fish photos in my presentation, um, but I really appreciate you having me. Um, thank you very much. So my name is Sharon Benjamin, and I'm a NEPA policy analyst in my day job at the Greater Atlantic Regional Fisheries Office uh, in Gloucester. But today I'm uh, here to share some background on this NOAA Fisheries Equity Environmental Justice Strategy. It's a draft strategy that we've been working on for a few months, and I really appreciate the chance to share with, with you and members of the public tuning in. So today I'm looking to share some background on the, on the working group that wrote the strategy uh, draft document and explain some of the equity and environmental justice <laughs> mandates, thank you, um, that we're working under and that motivated the formation of this working group. And I can provide some context on how the strategy was developed and how it's framed out. And I'll wrap up with some information on how you can provide feedback if you'd like. So, um, so this is great. This is the right slide. Um, so as I said, uh, well, this working group was launched in response to the executive order signed in January 2021, the EO 13985, which is the Advancing Racial Equity and Environment and Support for Underserved Communities through the, fe through the federal government uh, executive order. And so the working group is comprised of staff representing each of the science centers, regional offices, and program offices, such as the Highly Migratory Species Office. Uh, next slide, please. So as I mentioned, um, this, this group was launched in response to the executive order 13985. And this work is has come about because we're newly motivated with this executive order and another executive order to take a closer look at how we can achieve equitable outcomes through our work with these executive orders um, listed here. The first one, as I mentioned, and the second is 14008, which is tackling the climate crisis at home and abroad. Uh, we've actually been doing 
work incorporating equity and environmental justice for a long time because it's the right thing to do. And we've been working under uh, several mandates and including the 1994 executive order related to environmental justice and most and several of our mandates that we work under normally, such as the Magnuson Stevens Act, uh, Endangered Species Act, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, all have elements of environmental justice um, uh, in in their mandates and how we how we do our work. So we've been doing this for a little while, and um, but this is a new, fresh take on what we're doing and how we can make it better. So I just want to take a moment here to highlight key terms. I don't have a different slide for it, but the three terms that are mentioned in these in these uh, executive orders, the first is underserved communities. And that term describes groups that have been systemically denied opportunities to participate. Um, these are geographic communities and populations that share a particular characteristics, including, for example, women and girls, black and indigenous populations, um, LGBTQIA uh, plus individuals, and others um, who, who fit uh, that category. The next term is equity, which is the consistent and systemic fair treatment for everyone, including those who belong to underserved communities. And then finally, the last term is environmental justice, which is the fair and fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people. And simply put, we want to ensure both equal access to benefits as well as uh, equal protection from environmental harm and hazards for all communities. So that's a quick rundown of those terms. I'm trying to move quickly. So next slide, please. So as I mentioned, um, we launched the working group in spring 2021. We developed it uh, with some input we solicited from federally and non-federally recognized tribes, territories, and indigenous communities um, in November 2021, and uh, went through an internal review process. And the big red arrow points to where we are now, which is looking for public feedback on, on this strategy document. Um, and we rolled it out publicly in May, and we are accepting comments and feedback through the end of this month on August 31st. And so we're hoping this fall to take in all that feedback, incorporate it, improve the document and publicize, uh, yeah, publish a final EEJ strategy uh, by the fall. And by spring 2023, we hope to be able to incorporate uh, elements of these um, strategic goals into each regional office's um, operating plans. Next slide, please. So here's here's the meat of it. This is where uh, it gets more interesting. So I wanted to explain how the strategy is framed out. And so to achieve equity and environmental justice in our work, we um, we serve a diverse array of communities, and we realize not all communities have equal opportunities and access to our services. So to get there, we have three overarching goals. The first is the meaningful involvement of all underserved communities, and that includes identifying them ensuring equitable treatment and engaging them meaningfully in our work. The second is the equitable delivery of services. And the third is prioritizing EEJ work uh, in our mandated uh, mission work. So the strategy is going to require step down implementation plans, as I mentioned. Um, these will be tracked with annual progress reports. And we hope this is going to uh, really help us make improvements in our work in six core areas. So you can see there's an over, um, overarching goal of creating an empowering environment. And this is referring to making it realistically possible and, and um, truly practically uh, possible to help NIMFS staff, NOAA Fisheries staff, uh, accomplish these goals. And that means uh, meaningfully integrating EEJ into our day-to-day -day work with institutional support such as training, resources, things like translation services, things that make it possible uh, to improve our EEJ work. And then the five uh, goals under that, I'll go through them briefly. The first is policy, which is referring to incorporating equity environmental justice into our policies and plans. And thinking about, for example, what additional flexibility we can provide in our policies to incorporate uh, local language and customs, for example help make these um, these programs better. The second is research and for instance this includes identifying underserved communities, addressing their needs, 
and assessing the impact of management choices on them. And for example, we could improve this by surveying to understand barriers to entry in things like uh, fisheries and the aquaculture, aquaculture industry. And through that, identifying potential policy changes to address that. Um, the next is outreach, which is, um, includes, for example, building relationships with underserved communities. And we're hoping that we can find ways to engage underserved communities through outreach, such as with mentorship programs, um, for instance, training programs that might navigate a permit application process for grant programs or a grant proposal process. The next is benefits, and we're hoping to achieve an equitable distribution of benefits. And an example of this is um, assessing our grant programs, our projects and disaster declarations and where and assessing anywhere our funding is going to um, ensure that it's reaching underserved communities. And finally, for inclusive governance, this is um, trying to reach an inclusive access to decision to the decision making process. And one example is having the hybrid meeting style um, is one way to ensure uh, virtual participation. Next slide, please. So why am I sharing this today? I wanted to update you on this effort that NOAA Fisheries has undertaken, and we're also requesting feedback. Um, we're looking for feedback from you and, and from the public if possible um, by the end of the month. And um, some of the things we can think about, um, some example questions you might consider um, when thinking about uh, this document is, for example, who are our underserved communities and how can we better communicate with them? We wanna improve this document to make it as strong as possible as we implement it in our day-to-day -day work. Uh, next slide, please. And this slide, uh, so I, I provided a, a couple of pieces of material ahead of the presentation um, to, to Tony just to uh, provide the strategy itself, a PDF of the strategy, some frequently asked questions and uh, links to various materials. But if you didn't see that or you don't know where those are, that's okay. This slide I put together to try to make it easy to find the materials quickly. Uh, if you go to fisheries.noaa.gov and search EEJ, where in that search tab where there's the orange, it didn't quite format correctly, so I apologize for that. Um, but if you search EEJ, the third link that pops up um, is where that red arrow is pointing to the NOAA Fisheries Invites Public Comment link. And you see the nice picture of the family fishing together. And that page gives you access to the EEJ strategy. It gives you um, executive summary translations into several languages, including uh, Chinese, French, Haitian, Hawaiian, Portuguese, Spanish, and, and several others. Um, and it's, uh, there's also a link to the comment form where we're hoping folks will consider providing feedback. And if all else fails, please feel free to email me. Again, my name is Sharon Benjamin, and you can email me at sharon.benjamin at noaa.gov. And I'd be very happy to answer any questions by email, or if we have time, I will do my best to answer them today. So we can leave this, this slide up. And thank you again for your time. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Sharon. Any any questions for Sharon? Don't see any hands raised, Sharon. So thank you for the presentation and thank you for providing us with the information to follow up on this. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Yeah, I guess the question for, for those who are left in the room and conscious uh, is, <laughs> you know, do we do we want to comment uh, as a commission or is this something that uh, might be best left to individual states, agencies, individuals, so forth, so on? I'm not sure how we would necessarily coalesce everybody together as a commission comment. Um, I mean, you all know your own, you know, your own backyards better than than the commission does. So, uh, just a question. So, Dan, I suspect many of our states have similar initiatives, so it may be difficult for us to say sign on to a letter that's not aligned with 
with our state policies and initiatives, but that's just one thought. All right. Okay. All righty. Well, we are at the end of our agenda. We have no compli non-compliance findings, thankfully. So, and we'll have no need for a business session, but we do have one other matter of business and I want to call on Tony. And this is a very important matter of business. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so Maya has been the master behind the screen, the voice of God from above um, this week. She couldn't make it in person. And I'm sorry to say that because this is Maya's um, last week with the commission. She has accepted a spot at the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science Master's Program. And we are super excited for her to be joining that team. Perhaps she'll work on some spot project with Mike Wilberg or Jenny Neslidge and be coming back to the board to present her findings. We don't know. Um, but Maya has been just um, an instrumental support of so many of the commission's programs. For me personally and the ISFMP team, we are so grateful for all of the work that she does for us. I know the science team is incredibly grateful as well. And, um, you know, working under Tina as the communications director, Maya has been instrumental in pulling together the story maps that the commission has produced over the past couple of years. And, and then I don't know anybody that can take motions as well as Maya does. Um, I, I'm so sad to see her leaving us, but really excited for her. Um, so Maya, we wish we could send you off in person, but you know, thank you again for all that you've done for us over the years. Yeah, thank you, Maya, and we wish you the best um, as you go forward uh, into a graduate program. And uh, as uh, Tony said, we uh, we might just cross paths again one day. Maybe not some of us who were a little longer in the tooth, but uh, some some of the other ones. Uh, so, all right, is there any other business to come before the policy board? I do not see any. Any objection to adjournment? I do not. Don't you dare. Uh, I, I do not see. So we will stand adjourned. Thank you. And I look forward to seeing everybody in New Jersey.